Tuck by Mark Miller Copyright 2023 Author Name All Rights Reserved Modern Life Rail The upbeat spring of 2068 played host to the opening of the world's first modern life rail. The unveiling ceremony took place in London City's Broad Street Station. Great Britain's beautiful and sparkling youthful monarch, Queen Elixiel was the guest of honor at the event held in recognition of Her Royal Highness's golden reign. She stood beaming brightly in attendance at this very special occasion in the long illustrious history of British innovation. The late King Harry's daughter wore a blue gown with petite bauble South African cut diamond studs signaling her personal pride and understandable English excitement on this most memorable day. The crystal carriage doors with gold Joffa Majel Ferry World handles were held open by her utilitarian royal spouse Prince David, the Duke of Somerset. The Queen's fabulous gown sparkled flawlessly as she stepped out in her bejeweled splendor. She emerged from the floating crystal gold carriage before the London crowd with a bottle of the kingdom's finest champagne lovingly clasped in her cream silk gloved right hand. She held the freezing beverage up high with a pompous pose. Alexiel did so with blog gossip perfection, shrewdly synchronized to receive the wild cheers and ecstatic screams from the sovereign queen's stoutest subjects. Promptly, the cutest ever of all England's queens, who was never averse to over-the-top British behavior, waved the bottle of bubbly three times to receive more cheers. She teased the bold front of Broad Street Station's only magnificently huge snake-like odd train, which that morning had been placed mathematically and precisely upon its single silent kinetic track, poised to make its maiden journey throughout the British Isles. She swiftly smashed the champagne bottle with a brave, bubbly splintering splash against the gleaming, impervious iridium-studded train's front carriage, beginning the history of Great Britain's magnificent modern life rail. Train City Soon the modern life rail became known as the MLR, occasionally pronounced MLA by those with a particularly nasty partiality toward butchering the British language. Train City was planned as a kinetic energy-induced rail system that moved continuously at a fixed speed. The train speed was fixed relative to the location of the train at any given time. British scientists devised a system of siphoning off the kinetic energy that was created and diverting it into nearby towns to provide maintenance and hospitality services to the MLR community. The rate at which kinetic energy was diverted directly impacted the speed of the MLR, which was in all respects a self-contained city on rail. The main body of the MLR had three levels, the upper level was an occupancy level, fully encased in reinforced glass with color-altering options from clear to pitch black, the middle level was the artificial environment level, and the lower level was split into two sections, a passageway and a public area that lead from one coil section to another, connecting the maintenance and engineering sections. Train City was a technological masterpiece about the width of a British dual carriageway with coiled segments styled upon the mythical midsection of a dragon skeleton. Each Train City level contains sleeping quarters, bathrooms, kitchens, study and living areas. Each coil section was about the size of a comfortable apartment dwelling. Individual coil section compartments provided medical centers, schools and as it came to be known, the famous Infomemory Galleria. There were also gymnasiums, 
swimming pools, spas, banks, entertainment centers, hygiene centers, restaurants, and even judicial courts, police stations with many jails and much more, depending on the level of necessity and imagination the designer had to offer. An absolute marvel in its early years, the MLR snaked itself gracefully around the concrete jungles, bridges, hills, and sage and pot-colored valleys of the British Isles. Before its creation, there was talk of laying tracks through Western Europe and eventually northward, clockwise through the wild rock-reached hills of Eastern and Southern Europe to give the best of British ingenuity to communities that lacked the beneficial advances of Britain's best technology, said certain interested business people who continually advise Parliament to do just that. Surreptitiously, this professional class quite often packed their overnight bags and state-of-the-art human manipulators, the ultimate corporate executive organizer, with all sorts of customized applications to manage a business person's minute-to-minute -minute schedule to increase efficiency and travel to Brussels to convince the European Union Parliament to create something like the MLR and pay them a boatload of cash for it. The United States of America, itself no slouch where technology remained key, looked on jealously, clearly knowing that it could cost 100 years of labor and a billion buckets of borrowed bank cash to put an infrastructure that could support an MLR like dear ally Great Britain, now had in place. The business community was aware of this and began to plan ways the empire of dollar could get it done. Yet for all its boldness, the MLR had not been a simple rail system to incorporate. National regulation had to be written and made part of the law of the land before the first iron bolt could be produced or shipped from American-owned steel plants in the Orich Chinese province owned by Fane Capital plc. Occasionally there were protests at such an invention, but these were quite petty and very quickly faded as the prospect of new jobs, services and communities became obvious. The most important concern was the effect the modern life rail would have on people. While scientists set about designing the structure and function of the MLR, it became clear as early as 2062 that future citizens of the MLR would no longer need to leave the train unless vacationing the chance, many whispered, to escape the rule of British law. The ever-watchful British Parliament learned of this chatter and, supported by strong and complicated law mandated. A. Anyone born on the MLR instantly became a citizen of the modern life rail. B. The MLR fully be part of Great Britain. This gave rise to a new form of nationality that became law in 2067, which, by its very description, became part of European Union law. In one of her initial press releases the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Idril Clark, daughter of the distinguished British ambassador and former MI6 by Lord Ronan Clark, announced that Anyone travelling on the MLR either needed to be a registered citizen of the MLR or a resident citizen by birth, or if not, required a visa issued by British authorities to travel on the MLR. Time Traveller in the summer of 2089, I traveled to a place in the future where I met a young woman who when I first found her, was seated on a device in her room. I later learned that it was called a breast, a Baghdad device. This was the first time I had been to this place, so everything seemed strange to me. Before I started visiting the future, I read reports that warned time travelers to be careful not to interfere in the lives of the people they met. It didn't quite make sense to me at the time but now, as I looked at the strange breast chair she sat in, it did. I wanted to laugh. It looked funny, a strange kind of funny with its complex network of finely enmeshed, tiny tubes with a suction device at one end and a pump at the other. As she sat upon it, her weight triggered a suction of air through the lower tubes, then immediately pumped out the air at the other end, and then sucked it back in when she moved. I noticed this happened even when she breathed. The suction and pumping motion appeared to create a state of support. It was an invisible armchair sofa. What are you sitting on? I asked, forgetting that I should have said hello first and maybe even introduced myself. A breast. 
It is incredibly comfortable. It was invented by friends of trees to stop global pillaging. She answered without seeming surprised at my presence in her room. I could tell that she lived with her parents. She looked too young to live alone and the surroundings appeared too comfortable for one so young to have acquired. She almost seemed relieved to have someone with whom to talk and lost little time indulging me. My name is L'Oreal, L'Oreal Snowdell. My mother is Amamel Snowdell, and my father is Jakali Snowdell. Their productive potential outputted itself at the Infomemory Galleria on Baker Street in London Centre, so I know it's entirely natural for you to be here. I understand in the past they used to call visitors like you ghosts, spirits, or poltergeists, but now we know you are time travellers. She surprised me. For a moment I didn't know what to say. You see, this was the first time I spoke to someone in the future. I was not sure if what I was doing was acceptable or legal. I had to sign lots of forms and get licenses to travel and I was reminded continually not to interfere. L'Oreal interrupted my thoughts. Do you think I have an interesting name? Perhaps you would consider my name to be beautiful, charming maybe, the type that sticks in your mind. In my mind? I was pretty sure she meant my mind but couldn't be certain. Yes, in your mind. It's so important for me to remember the sound of my own name. A name is intimately personal. When I hear my name, I feel a sense of presence, a consciousness, as if I have been awoken and invited to be part of the instant moment. Is that so? Please, say my name. I really shouldn't be talking to you. Section 3 of the Time Travel Rule Book. It's easy. Just start with the L, then make an O with your lips like fat fish in a bowl do. I felt silly, but here we go. I thought, after all, laws and rules were made to be broken, as my father used to say. And he should know, considering he was the British ambassador at the same time as being a spy. As instructed, I pursed my lips into an O shape. Now breathe out as you say, real, with hot Latin flair. I carefully watched L'Oreal's lips. I listened to her instructions. Then I did as she did. I was comforted knowing no one from my time could see me making a fool of myself, but I must confess, it did feel like fun. There. That wasn't difficult, was it? She seemed at least somewhat satisfied. If you say so, I replied. I quickly saw L'Oreal was not done. Now without my help say my name give me a sense of consciousness a sense of being okay i conceded but do you really need to be so dramatic l'oreal turned away from me toward a window to watch a town pass by us i followed her gaze the image left a blur in my mind wait a minute i told myself either this room i am standing in is moving or the town outside is moving something is moving she interrupted my thought. Have you said my name yet? I had more important things to think about. Something around me was obviously shifting and I was beginning to feel queasy the more aware of the movement I became. I, I replied. No, you haven't because I still feel numb. I pinched myself as reassurance that I was feeling something, anything other than numbness. She mirrored me, pinching the flesh on her own slender smooth brown forearm. I peeked out of the window. Not good I thought as the sight of another town flitting past caused a nauseous wave that I tried to subdue, absorb, internalize to avoid feeling any pain at all. Now, right now, in this very personal moment. I must confess the only thing I felt that was personal about the moment was my round trip ticket. L'Oreal kept on. All I need to feel, all I want to feel is the sound of you saying my name. Please, say my name. Bring me to consciousness. Make me feel as though I belong. I need that. We need that, each other, the contact, a sense of presence. L'Oreal, I apologize for interrupting, but what time is it? It's 3 p.m. here, but I don't know what time it is outside. Great, that makes a lot of sense to me. 
I slept because I was so tired and now, I am awake. Sometimes I think I am dreaming, and then suddenly I am brought to life, to consciousness, when I hear my name. L'Oreal, I said aloud. I gently arched my head to the left to get her attention. I hope you don't think I am a strange one. Do you? I stood there with one hand on my stomach and the other gripping the window sill. I quickly straightened my head and smiled. Oh no. Who am I to judge? I am not. I am only 19. Just a kid, they say. Daddy is always pointing that out. I know it's a fact, but what can I do? She gazed at me searching into the depths of my eyes for judgment, for opinion, or for criticism. She found none. Just a pleasant smile as I reminded myself of the Time Traveler's Guide Neutrality Policy. My smile widened like a moviegoer on a packed opening night, completely oblivious to what to expect next, but convinced it had to be good because it cost money to get a seat in front of a silver screen. What's done is done. I can't change it. I am thankful that they don't change it here anymore. What's done L'Oreal? My queasy stomach began to subside. This strange girl in the future had captured my complete attention. She was cute to look at, even if what she said and where we stood as she said it, left me bemused. L'Oreal's face became quizzical. I could see a thought working its way from her forehead to her lips. Some people do, I hear. They call them old humans. I wondered if she even realizes how confused I was becoming. Because all she did was grin and say. Thick-skinned dinosaurs. What? Dinosaurs in the future? No, the people silly. Sometimes mother told me stories about a time when they tried to change it, force it, reverse it, even abort it. Yuck. Barbarous times they were. But times are different now. I nodded in agreement. Frankly, what else could I do? I was in the future in a room that moved, talking to a cute girl I could not understand although we both spoke English. The word refund jumped into my mind but they did warn us that they could not be held responsible for exactly where we ended up. Treat it like an adventure, they said. This was more like a plot in a Roald Dahl novel, certainly unexpected. I think we need everyone, and everybody here accepts that we do. 19 is really young. Yeah, really young by the looks I get. By the way, thank you for saying my name. Do you notice the difference in me now, how animated my personality has become? My lips pursed to say something smart, but my mind chose to remain silent. I kept my mouth shut and smiled, grateful that my mind and I chose to observe instead. You can say so if you want to. Being shy gets you nowhere in 2089. It's almost worse than never hearing your name being called. Imagine having a feeling of joy or of love, mine was of love. Imagine never using sound to express that feeling or emotion. It's 2089. It made me shiver when my daddy told me stories about a time when emotions and feelings were repressed in a society that had only one way to communicate. Imagine, only one method to express your instant desire or displeasure. I smiled and wondered if I could try out that breast chair as I couldn't help myself from peeking out the window in time to see yet another town flip by as the sky outside became darker. Say my name again. It felt really good the very first time you said it. Really L'Oreal? Are we going to go through this again? It felt like a mini bonfire raging with life, if only for one night. Okay, I said as I repeated her name. She acknowledged it, cheeks glowing and dimples I hadn't noticed before, appearing. I am going to shower now. You cannot watch me. Our bodies are still sacred. It's not right to have our bodies gawked upon by strangers. But you did say my name and well, I suppose you will understand how I feel about privacy, a young woman's privacy, although you can follow me to the hygiene center. I thought, I really wanted to get out of that room but was in two minds because the future was playing havoc with my brain. She could see that I seemed reluctant to leave that place, 
yet L'Oreal insisted. Come on. I am just going to get my dressing gown and do something like this with my hair. What's wrong? You look disturbed, out of sorts or puzzled. I pointed to the window. Oh, that's why. Why did you look outside? It will just confuse you. Citizens of the MLR can look outside. They can take it all in. But visitors find it difficult to cope with the change in environment. Yes, I argued, but it's pitch black out there right now and as bright as hell in here. I don't often look outside. I only peek sometimes when I feel brave and want to be more like the grown-ups. I guess I will have to be courageous more often now that it shows. What shows? I was confused again. Hey, but you're an adult, aren't you? Yes. I nodded. You look 20-something, right? I noticed that when I first saw you step into my room. I was amazed. You saw me enter your room? You're really not from here are you? Now, I can tell. I can. It's your first time, isn't it? I nodded, feeling naive. I giggled nervously. Although I was progressively losing my privacy, I began to feel a little better. Why didn't they tell us, the people in the future would be quite nutty? Come here. Hold this book. As I neared her, I could see the bulge protruding from her stomach and wondered why I did not notice it before. She backed away. Why are you looking at me like that? Stop. It wasn't my fault. I shouldn't be made to feel like a freak. You time travelers from the past, with your old-fashioned ways. I wish you all would just stay outside of our present, where you belong. Oh L'Oreal. I felt awful. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to offend you. I just didn't notice it before. We don't judge in our time, I know you are trying to tell me you didn't say anything, but the eyes speak as well as the mouth. I know you were judging me. I'm sorry, I told her, and I genuinely was. I was amazed at the instant change in her after that. Daddy is taking me to Hastings by the sea this evening, so I must get ready. Time is passing. It must be 3.40 pm by now. I would say you could join us, but my parents are not in the slightest partial to time travelers. I doubt you'll stay until my return, but you could since there's so much to see and do here on the modern life rail. Rail? I echoed in amazement. Are we on a train? Yes of course. I was born here in March 2073, in call section 1540 between London and Watford. Of course. A train's motion explained the drastic changes in lighting and quick movement from outside. I try to imagine my mother going into labor in London and giving birth just before getting to Watford. Crazy, right? Unbelievable actually. I was feeling much better, now that I understood more of where I was. Yep, this is my home, my space. That's why I don't look outside much. I don't need to be confused, to watch the blue skies out there, gorgeous and inviting and then to turn back to the darkness in here. Most of us in these coil sections are asleep while it's daytime outside. Everybody sleeps during the day. It was difficult for me to process that day was night there and night was day. Yes, everyone apart from my parents and the others who work in the maintenance, engineering, or food court sections. Have you ever not lived here? I never really felt a need to get off, or even to look outside for too long. But it is not something me or most of my friends think about doing. We have lived on the MLR all our lives apart from occasional trips to the seaside towns. Those were fun. I would scream in amazement as the gelid eels were eaten by the seaside peoples of Southend in Essex. I watched as a moment of maturity came over L'Oreal. I guess all of that will have to stop now, cease and fade into my childhood. Because, I am getting ready to say hello to the child I am expecting. She looked at me with a proud smile on her face. 
I never forgot that look. Then she gave me a different look, one I was becoming familiar with. Say my name before we go out into the busy passageway. Please, say my name. Oh, and say the name of my unborn child, a boy. I am going to call him Tark. I intend to bless Tark with my enduring love. You should come see us. Go on you say it. Tark Snowdell. Let him hear you. Come closer to my tummy. Now say it. Tark Snowdell. That's when I broke another rule from the guidebook and came closer to L'Oreal's stomach and said the name more than once, aloud, in a high voice. Okay. That's enough. He is getting excited. I can feel his mood mingling with mine. Let's go. The end of part one. Tuck. By. Mark Miller. Part 2. Sound. I met L'Oreal a second time. On this occasion I found her walking back to her home along the middle level passage. She was carrying quite a few tote bags filled with items. After a lengthy argument with the time travel port authority, I was able to get a discount on my second trip after threatening to report the travel operator for failing to adequately describe the potential health risks associated with traveling into the future. Going back in time was different. There was enough material to prepare a time traveler for what to expect. This was not the same when traveling to the future. Some tour operators, it was alleged, simply fabricated their travel brochures. L'Oreal looked heavily pregnant now but smiled when she saw me standing outside the door to her home. I read somewhere that 3D special effects used to be all the rage in the 2060s. Apparently, this technology is very popular in your time. Who told you? How do I know, you ask? Yes, how do you know? Well, you are not from today so I will tell you. It's the way your eyes follow me. You seem surprised, like you never thought we would be this different, not at all like your society imagined. That obvious? Yes, but I do understand and after all I am glad that you did come back. I am glad to be back too. I needed to process the first visit. And prepare for the second visit. And here I am. What did you think of my parents, different right? Well, let's just say it was memorable. They are still arguing together about it. Dad is in dismay. Mum wants to make my ex-boyfriend pay. But I tell them both it is okay. I prefer to do this on my own. But your future? What's that about my future, my career? Yes. You are so new here, aren't you? You should watch the floating concube visions. It is nothing hot. But you might think so. It's like a floating cube that attracts broadcasts from wireless media. 
It always has the latest news, the latest fashions and culture. We can watch eight discussion channels at the same time by turning it around so that we can see eight points of view, contrasting opinions on the same topic, then, each screen itself has eight channels. There's access to six to four channels and each of those six to four screens has eight sub-channels that can either project onto an exterior surface or produce a hologram inside a fourth dimension. Neat, right? Great gimmick. 512 channels on a single floating cube. It's more than just a gimmick, silly. Okay. Do you need a hand? Here is the last of the bags to carry in. I took the remaining bags and placed them on the countertop in the kitchen. L'Oreal kept a bag with her. Come. Sit down with me and look through these books. Why? Our rules say we cannot absorb knowledge from the future that can be used to gain an advantage in the past. So, what's your point? What's my point? Well, with so many opinions and interpretations leading all the way back to your time and even further back, people realized before I was even born, I think, that imposing or proposing the idea of a future profession onto us was a paradox. Why? Because my future is created by my actions in the present. My present becomes my future, not as I think about my future, but only as I act in my present. So, thinking about the future without acting in the present will bring mostly confusion because my future can only be created by me in my present. This is different from a distant hope for my future based on nothing in my present, but the words of a politician who is unrelated to my present, peddling promises about my future. Twisted, you think. You noticed then? You are silly. It's simple. How? Look. All things peddle something, so I do not need an unconnected politician to peddle for me. I peddle tomorrow, my future, myself, as long as I accept that my moments are my own creation and that I am completely responsible for the consequences they lead me to. How does it work? I don't know. It's a modern idea that they call instantism. That explains her attention span I thought to myself. It is suggested by the great minds of our time. Great minds? Yes, you had your great minds in your time, didn't you? So, you know how they think. They pedal until they cannot pedal anymore. Reasonable, I said in response. I was losing myself again and wondering if I needed to file another complaint about the efficacy of the travel brochure. Meanwhile L'Oreal had delved into the bag she had kept with her. Hey, well look at this one. I looked closer. Aren't you thirsty? I quickly shook my head, denying her invite. Section 6 of the Travel Guide to the Future Sorry, I forgot. You can't eat or drink here. Sorry. I am able to, though. Do you mind? Can you get me an orange juice? No, strawberry instead. Thanks. I handed her the bottle with an image of a strawberry on it. Yeah, as I was saying, look at this book. I grinned, almost a smirk. Finally, something familiar. Yep, we still sell books in 2089. It's the one thing that doesn't seem to change. Anyway, this book reckons that language is linked or can be transferred in every single sound that can be heard, if the sound is isolated and ordered. They say codified. Confusing, right? I walked over to L'Oreal and gave the book a good glare. Don't get all fussy. Ouch. Tark kicked. He's saying thanks for that refreshing drink. I think he liked it. You had peculiar doctors and thinkers back in your time, always considering tomorrow. Same as ours do, I suppose but I see this writer was from your time. Yep, your contemporary. Dr. Charles Goddell Meninger. Apparently, his grandfather was a groundbreaking scientist. Very famous. I pointed to a picture I could see in the book. It was of a happy man. Yes, 
that's him in the picture on the second page. Look. Dr. Kunda Meninga. I know him well. My father actually met him. So, are you familiar with the Meninga Institute of Technology? Somewhat. You are? Good. Well anyway, this Dr. Charles Goddell Meninga authored this book about it, sounds and language, very detailed stuff. I like it. Don't you think it's cool, the idea of creating language from any sound? How? I haven't read the doctor's book yet. I recently bought it. I just think it's cool. I could teach Tark to converse like this, to understand the language of everything that makes a sound. I know it is dreamy, like some sort of far-fetched science fiction idea, but don't I, we who are here, live on what your time calls science fiction. I was born on your time's science fiction. Our modern life rail is to you and your society nothing but a piece of science fiction, an idea that your time did not take seriously. Yet, look, I live on it. Okay, I'm sorry for sounding so skeptical. I forgive you, but what do they say when you go back? You mean my family and friends? Nothing. They don't notice that I have gone. Oh right. Universal dependence. I thought as much. They cannot tell. Only a few understand and they debrief me to make sure I have not broken any time travel rules. The majority think it is still just science fiction. Yes, we are ignorant in comparison if that's what you are trying to say. Okay, okay. I won't say any more if you are going to get all touchy about it, but it's nice to see your humanness, quite beautiful and unusual in my time. My stomach shows now. Not long to go. So, what do you think? It comes with musical notes, sim sounds, and headphones. I inspected it further. Contraption. No, silly. It's not a contraption. It's technology. Ha ha ha, hold on. Let me read the preface to you. You can teach the unborn. Oh, this is so me. I shook my head in a sudden motion, to right then to left and back before staring at L'Oreal. Okay, I won't editorialize. Child to communicate by playing these 26 sounds and then when the child is born, associate the 26 sounds with these shapes and numerical sequences, each corresponding with these notes that will then be attached to one of the 26 sounds while showing the child each of the 26 letters of the alphabet. The child will learn to associate the sound to the note to the shape to the alphabetic sequence, all in one thought. What does it claim? I asked. I was impatient, not understanding what could come of it. Wait. I am getting there. Gosh. You time travelers are so pushy. You'll push yourselves right into tomorrow if you are not too careful. So, it claims that the child will understand the language of all things that make sound and be able to tell if those sounds mean something. If they are a form of language, they are then used for communication. Excuse me? That's what it says the doctor thinks. Don't ask me how. I am just a pregnant woman who is trying to invest her now in her child's tomorrow. You are so smart L'Oreal. I am just eager to know more. Thank you, that's very sweet of you. I will read it all and try the exercises. I have three months remaining so I will have time. Will you come back to visit me before Tark is born? I will try, but I cannot promise. Time travel, like public transport is also subject to delays in my time. If you could, I would like that. I made a mental note to at least try to schedule a trip in three months time. It's getting late. I am not as strong as before. My medical support cell constantly suggests that I get more rest. I think maybe now it is a good time to take the cell's advice. UMMM, I think I'll just close my eyes for 10 minutes. Nice talking to you again. Birth.
Autumn 2089. L'Oreal Snowdell had more than enough of the floating cubes coverage of cute but aging British Queen Elixir's much mediaized five-day trip to sunny Santa Monica in California. She shifted the info memory data feeding stream to the standby position with the heat of her concentrated thought. Her belly was acting up. Not long now. She looked around her immediate bedroom environment of bright beige blankets with overdone orange tasseled pillows designed to fire up an expectant mother's imagination. L'Oreal wondered what raising a child outside of the MLR would be like. Quickly, she dismissed such curt notions. She was happy here. What more could she ask for in her dilemma? L'Oreal reminisced upon her visit from the time traveler, wishing he was here right this very instant, as instinctively she knew it was almost time to give birth to Tark. Ouch! L'Oreal's medical cube, sensitive to such human painful pangs, placed an immediate request for midwife assistance. Within five minutes an opening emerged in a previously seemingly seamless section of walled space in the Infomemory Galleria, permitting two midwives to enter. They were wearing white and clinically clean clothing. L'Oreal, sweetie, we can see you are almost due. Come. Ouch. He kicked again. I must sit down. No. Don't help me. I can do this myself, if I always accept help when I feel pain, I will become weak. Tark will become weak, and I want Tark to be strong, to stand up to life's challenges and not to be one who gives up and fades into extinction. Ouch! No wait, promise me you will play this sim sound patch as Tark is being born. Please promise. I cannot see why not, can you can? No Mersha. Sounds harmless to me. Miss Snowdle we must go now. Ouch! Yelled L'Oreal this time at the top of her modern voice as Tuck kicked with gusto causing L'Oreal to double down toward the ground. Mesha rushed to L'Oreal and threw her left arm, like the professional she was, securely around L'Oreal's waist, grabbing the Simsound patch with her outstretched fingers in a single motion. Ken followed up supporting the rear and both midwives led L'Oreal to a patient seater. L'Oreal sat in it. Any medical procedures normally undertaken by a bunch of medical professionals were, in order of necessity, initiated whilst L'Oreal sat. Then her mind picked up pace and she began to mutter. My mother, my father, time traveler. Your medical cube informed them though it seems the time traveler request was patient incoherence. Anyway, your parents will be at the delivery center as you arrive. Relax now. The vibration of the seat steadily increased its oscillatory rocking causing L'Oreal to relax, an incrementally deepening relaxation that led L'Oreal incorrigibly to fall fully asleep. She awoke and before her eyes there was, as she later blogged, the most beautiful object I have ever seen, a sweet chocolate brown baby with curly black hair, sensitive eyes, and a serene smile upon cutely pursed rosy baby lips. My son, Tark, and I whispered to him, welcome Tark, Tark Snowdell. I am L'Oreal, L'Oreal Snowdell. Your mother, sweetie pie, and you are my son. Tark, I love you, love you, love you. Then I kissed both his chocolate cheeks before resting my Tark's whole beautiful chocolate brown baby body between my breasts and together there, serenely we slept. Music According to the shared memory of the citizens of the modern life rail, it was said that the summer of 2094 was one of the warmest ever recorded. L'Oreal preferred not to take Tark out after he had experienced exhaustion in the unusually hot Merseyside Liverpool city centre recently. The word difficult seemed insufficient to describe L'Oreal's maternal moments overseeing Tark's indoor activities that day. Stop that Tark! Demanded L'Oreal in a voice that although stern, reeked of a doting love and candid admiration. 
Ta continued excruciatingly and inquisitively scraping with an annoying screeching sound made by a rock, a child's hand-sized sharp surfaced rock, along the varnished flooring of the modern life rails public recreation compartment he played in. L'Oreal stood staring at Tak in total shock. Tak was not insolent. At five years old he was merely experimenting with sound or all types of sound from assorted environments and forms, regardless of whether the environment was precious to someone else or not. Tak, I told you to stop. Oh, Tak why don't you listen to me? What am I going to do with you? You just don't listen. Tak stopped dragging the small rock across the varnished flooring, a rock he had found when the Modern Life Rail stopped the day before yesterday, in Liverpool city centre along the Merza River. The brash threading mark was appalling and long and bitter in appearance, especially if you were the one responsible for the cost of its repair. That pricey mark meant the whole coil section of the compartment flooring would need to be redecorated. As Tuck stopped, he looked up at his mother who stood ahead but not over him, her arms straight at each side of her body. She stared back. Tuck's eyes twinkled reflecting the meager light left in the public recreational compartment as the day outside waned. He smiled saying, Mummy don't worry. I'm just practicing. See, these sounds are different. He then took a stone, a lime one that he also found by the Merza River that day as it ran through the heart of the northern city. He held it in his other hand. With both a rock and a stone in each hand, gripped firmly Tuck once again descended onto his knees and proceeded to scrape both objects along the varnished flooring at varying speeds. He intertwined the harsh sound with the other, richer, deeper screeching sound in a way where each distinct, unique sound was soon cancelled out. All that could be heard was a sweet sonar humming that found its way through L'Oreal's ears canals into her brain's hypersensitive amygdala organ, causing her to experience a soothing emotion of tranquility that affected her mood like no sound had ever done before. L'Oreal's eyes visibly relaxed. A novel cheerful expression replaced her frown. The beat of her heart effectively introduced a state of happiness that she basked in. She felt like she had stepped into a different world, a place of utter serenity, where no type of jarring emotions could ever exist. Tuck stopped the moment it became apparent to him that his mother experienced that precise emotion he had artfully and skillfully designed for her to feel. You see mummy. Very cool. Right? Oh Tuck, it is amazing, wonderful, but what about the hardwood floor honey? It is ruined and we will have to pay to repair the damage. They will all be angry. I wish you would tell me before you decide to just experiment on private property. We are not rich son, no, just you and I talk. Grandad and Nanny don't have enough to pay for damage from your experiments. It will ruin them and in their senior years too. You wouldn't want that would you? Oh no, mummy. I love Nanny and Grandad. You will just have to take me to places where I can make music, proper music. Real music. My music mummy. Because nobody can make music like me. Shocked, L'Oreal fell back into a comfortable Brett's chair that was close by. You are just five years old. How do you know that? Because you did something to me. Remember mummy. Before I was born. When I was inside your tummy. Tark, how do you know that? Because of my sound memories, my music was born before I was. I experienced all your moods, and all that the womb would allow a child who has not yet been born. I remember a book you read to me each night before I was born, this is correct, right mummy? Yes, but how? Oh, oh I know, yes, that book by that advancing your child psychologist, Meninga. But wait a moment. Listen to me talking to a five-year-old like this. Anyone would think that I am going crazy but, that there is more talk, isn't there? Tell me son. 
Now is not the time to hide your thoughts from me. Okay, mummy, often I have the same dream about a beautiful fiery girl. She scares me. When she visits me, each time she places a kiss upon my lips. It burns me so badly. But still I seek another kiss and another. Until I feel as if I stand outside myself watching my own face burst into a soul flame. It then turns grey, ash-like. Then nothing, as a British wind bold, brisk, and baseless blows my ashen grey face to an unknown place and still I stand there unmoved, undead watching my headless self. Like you say mummy it's just you and me. I know there is nobody else in our lives to help us. That is why I say you will have to take me to a place where I can make music. This is what I will do as my years grace the sinew of my body. One year at a time and leave me old ashen and great but fulfilled because I would have made music. Music for my world. And you will be happy mummy at what has become of me. Because I know mummy, I felt your pain as well. I know that moment. Like, like guilt. Talk stop. Too much. Please don't say anymore. You just hurt mummy's mind. Sorry mummy. I felt the sadness that you experienced. Knowing that I was to be fatherless. But don't worry mummy, because it will make no difference. Not in the world I will live in. Tark, what are you saying? There are no children your age who talk and think like you. I don't know whether to believe you or ignore you or just find a psychiatrist for you. Tark my world is here on the MLR. I am no fiery girl. My hopes and desires are simple. You cannot ignore me mummy. No one can. My music will be beyond any that came before it or any that will come after it. Believe me mummy. We must leave this place if my playing causes others concern. I must be somewhere that is beautiful. A place where the heart rules the head. Here, we are in a place where we are not allowed to let go. We cannot let go of our self-control. If we do our home will cease to be a home. It will just stop. Imagine if the controllers just work with their hearts to decide what to do next. True, but fanciful darling Tark, you have never spoken this much since before. Tark honey. I really am confused. Are you sure you are, okay? Yes. You know why this is happening to me mummy. Please tell me what you did or what you had in mind before I was born. I need to. I must understand. Only if you come here. Sit down and act like a five-year-old boy. And not some wise old druid. In diapers. Tuck stood up, dropped the rock and stone. Both objects fell onto the varnished flooring with a thud like thick dried mud. The rock and stone bobbled about each in its own spot until settling and coming to rest. Tark stepped over both rock and stone and waddled awkwardly over to L'Oreal who had now seated herself in one of the three chairs positioned to face the outside scene view from the MLR window. Any previous indifference she had about looking outside took on a strange fresh appeal. Tark grabbed his mother's left knee pulling it toward him. He hoisted himself up to sit upon L'Oreal's knee and then eased himself gradually into L'Oreal's lap. When Tark was comfortable, he leant against his mother's tummy and allowed his head to fall back, couching itself cozily between her warm full breasts. L'Oreal wore a yellow summer dress which creased slightly as Tark couched there, slumped snugly into her lap. The time was now 7.45 pm on the MLR, which meant that it was almost midday outside. Only those who had business on land or as they called it terra firma cared, as most were content with the homely environment of the MLR as it spiraled itself around the British Isles, always at its own pace, creating a distinct state of reality for its citizens, visitors, and guests. The citizens of the MLR had been warned that the rules of universal dependence would be disturbed by spatial changes that would affect their perceptions of reality, especially when two or more systems with varying motion allow continuous varying states. 
They were advised that whilst on the MLR reality could only exist coherently inside the mind of the person experiencing it. This was the foundation of choice for the citizens of the MLR. The larger the lack of universal dependence the more reliable the individual choices, since 2068 this argument had formed the fundamental basis of the society of the inhabitants living on the MLR, making it difficult for any of them to view life outside the MLR as anything more than a collection of memories and moments to be captured on a device and stored in the info memory gallery. Tark was silent, his white chestnut-colored eyes fixed upon his mother's brown eyes as she considered his face. She soaked in pure satisfaction with this child that her selfish pride had convinced her to give birth to. Briefly, the pressure from family and friends to have an abortion flashed into then out of her mind. Talk darling. I had to figure out how I was going to raise you when I found I was pregnant. It was a lonely time for me. I had family but I always felt the eyes. The gazes, the remarks, and the silence. That is what made it worse. I think I could have coped better if everybody was open, honest. There were a few who asked me what on earth I was going to do, but my dear Tark. Honestly. I did not know. I just trusted myself to make the right decisions. L'Oreal swiveled away from Tark, slightly, surprising herself at the welling residue of emotion, evident in the form of a tear. Then, more tears trickled from each corner of her eyes like a lingering affectionate reminder of a time of doubt during the pregnancy. I have a friend, a stranger from the past. A time traveler. A reliable friend able to clip through time into the future. But he has been absent for some time now. Mummy. Do you mean someone from the Micronet community? I don't know Tark. Perhaps. Besides. What do you know about the Micronet community? When I said we cannot afford much. That also goes for Micronet brain implants too. Sorry Tark. You will not have the life of the enhanced. Although I read somewhere that life is not always so fabulous for the Micronet community. At least today we accept them for who they are. And not what we want them to be. I wish I could meet one mummy. You are very lucky. I hear adults talking about the Micronet community. I suppose I will never meet one of them. No Tark. And count yourself truly lucky. Because they are strange people with a weird outlook on life. That is to be expected from a member of the Micronet community. They are different. Their long lives mean they cannot understand the world in the same way you and I do. They don't need to talk because when we are old. They will still be in their late teens. I have heard it said that those who meet them change. Forever. Me mummy. What about me? I am coming to that. You, well. One day I was staring at my skin palm pad and I saw this peculiar infomercial by a child psychologist. A doctor based in Kenya in the International Center for Global Apothecary and Wellbeing based at the Meninga Institute of Neuroscience. The doctor claimed that one could have a conversation based on the sounds of nature. Not the sounds of the letters used to describe nature. He argued that the brain must absorb all data accessible to it. I don't understand it. Remember when you made that sound? Yes. I could make that sound because my memory of each sound was clear in my mind. But I was also able to imagine a difference in each sound so slight that it was equal in each separate sound. I knew that when sounds are made at the exact same time, the difference must blend itself out. Because two or more sounds cannot occupy the same pitch at the same time and remain distinct. I tried it and it worked. Cool, right, mummy? You, smart child. So, this, I think, is how you got the ability. The doctor wasn't just talking about the usual sounds of communication linked to letters. 
He was talking about all sounds, even those created by nature. The doctor said that if each note had a musical pitch or tone the person with the key to create musical codes would have the ability to make and manipulate all music. All rhythm anywhere. So now I remember I was in the info memory gallery. Here. Lower level. On our coil section of the MLR. The thought section. I will take you there tomorrow now that you are sprouting super neurons. In there I listened to a brief description of this new learning plan the doctor described. The doctor's name was Charles Godel Meninga. The doctor suggested that to improve the learning ability of a child, particularly that of an unborn child, the expectant parent should play a list of sounds identified as primary natural sounds. They should play them very close to the stomach so that the unborn child can hear each primary sound. Dr. Meninga assured his listeners no harm would come to the unborn child. Tark, I thought about it because I so wanted you to be able to have a good life the best life. Often, I would return to the info memory gallery to replay the ad repeatedly and watch the doctor describe this expedited learning method. But at 19 years old I was not quite sure what the doctor meant by make and manipulate. I understood that make, but not that manipulate. So, I sat by the Islab display screen, and enlarged it so I could observe every detail of the doctor's face. He looked like he was telling the truth. But you can never tell nowadays. They are so smooth when they are selling you something. You just cannot tell if they mean what they are saying or not. I guess the doctor was telling the truth. But he was a doctor. The new gods as they say. Ironic, but look around. See it, talk. We live on the MLR, one of the ideas of scientists. The world does well to call them the new gods. Yes, mummy. I understand that you played this book to me before I was born, but can you explain? How did it affect me? Each letter has a natural key code sound embedded in your subconscious. The key code sound for every sound exists in the subconscious information and each sound of the key codes are deep within the reservoir of your mind. You are beginning to create music from the infinite pool of key code sounds you learned before you were born. So, this sound I made, is not new? Yes, it is new for us. But for you Tark, the sound already exists in your mind. Yes Tark, you're just beginning to discover the wonderful nature of your mind. The rock and the stone are just random instruments to create a music you already know. Ha. Ah. Mummy. That sounds funny. How can this be? Well. Tark. Although impossible. Try to think of every single sound you know. Now realize you will learn more because it goes on and on forever. I know my syllables. And. At my alphabet. Very good talk. Also, every sound you hear can make music. It has its own pitch. And as you sleep or when you are occupied, your brain experiments and reasons. You have knowledge of musical sounds associated with both single letters and nature meanings and your brain combines them. Making musical sounds by using novel key code sounds for each letter. As in H-U-M-A-N. We hear human. All like one sound. Without questioning why, the key codes have been altered. Or even realizing that they have been altered. You can create complete language talk because you will have changed the spoken sound. You change it into a musical sound. The brain of the person hearing your musical sound will translate your sound into words only if it contains a key speech code. Because the subconscious mind has access to the essential nature of the sound. Its pitch. Signal. In its purest form. You are saying I can make music do what I want it to do. And this will keep it going on, forever. That I can even make things move and make people act a certain way. 
just like I did to you when I dragged the rock and stone along the varnished floor. L'Oreal smiled and, in her mind, mused. You are five, right? I suppose I do recall giving birth to you. Tark. This doctor also claimed that a mind with the ability to make and manipulate sound in this way would also be capable of creating the most beautiful music ever created or recognized by humanity. Possibly even beyond humanity. I was unable to help myself. I had to buy his book. So, I did, along with other learning tools to go along with it. I was driven. I played it to you passionately each day. At first you kicked, then elbowed. At first, I could sense your screaming protestations in my tummy. Then suddenly a warm feeling of oneness came all over me and I knew that finally. You had accepted it. Over the coming years L'Oreal and Tark entered a period of deeper understanding. L'Oreal frequently endeavored to present Tark with every opportunity she could to improve and control his musical skills. L'Oreal spent many hours with Tark by her side in the Infomemory Galleria, going through the recorded historic images of the known world, captured and stored on optical fibers by the intelligent citizens of the MLR, which they retained for use by their community. Tark enjoyed this and quickly slid from play to deep thought which began to express itself in simple short musical compositions. He would sing and play instruments, occasionally allowing the sounds of the environment around him to form part of his compositions. Then eventually over time more complex musical art forms emerged. Unconventional sounds were blended together to produce thought-provoking images and delicate actions in whosoever heard them. Tark shared his new music with his closest friends on the MLR and their remarks convinced him that when he grew up, he would become a musician. In the outer voids where humankind is not permitted one of the micronet community wandered alone in pain, her flesh aflame as she roamed endlessly, untamed. The End of Part 2 The Music of Tark Snowdell Based on the novel Tark By Mark Miller Copyright 2023 Author Name All Rights Reserved Part 3 Beauty The years and decades came and passed by until as is normal with plant and people, Tark grew into a young man. He studied regularly, dreamed of, desired, and eventually chose to pursue a life of music. He left his mother and the MLR to live close to Santa Monica's sweet, soft sand. Tuck found accommodation with a family in the Oceanside district of Santa Monica. The family lived in a large house that their granddad had built in the final year of the last World War, Wartec 2043. Three generations lived in the house at 24 Rose Avenue, Santa Monica, and still the family had room for a lodger. Tark spent many evenings sitting and talking about his music and upcoming concert on the porch at the front of the house with his landlord's father, a proud man with much to smile about. Granddad, as he was called by most of the inhabitants of that street often spoke about his son, daughter-in-law, and grandchildren. Granddad listened to Tark with interest and promised that he would convince the entire household to support Tark when that time came. During the early evening in the warm Californian winter of 2,121, 
just a breath before Tark's long-awaited concert, seagulls dipped their squawking beaks into the scummy foam left behind by the sea waves as they hurried back to their ocean homes. The sand bubbled up and as it did, they stopped squawking and their beaks stabbed at the bubbles appearing above the surface of the wet sand, dragging out of their soggy sandy cradles baby crabs deposited there by their mothers a full moon past. Grandad laughs as his granddaughter outpaces him. She seems in years not less than five and no more than six, yet her zest for life is clear. Grandad stops in the sand and places a hand on each hip, stares at her then smiles broadly knowing his genes will live on, contained in this healthy creature created by his children. Rising now in consistent symmetry, a gang of many gulls flap their wings wildly while soaring toward the ocean. The smell of sea crustaceans completely and utterly rivets their attention as the waters of the ocean creep closer to shore. A bright orange and yellow winter sun shining gracefully begins falling out of sight, slowly on the distant horizon. The day is almost done. A local family passes by Tark, who is seated in deep thought on the sand in front of the melodic ocean waves. A separate pair of lovers each going in opposite directions also meander by Tark. The smell of the sea is strong now and the people, Many residents of Santa Monica's beach town built in view of the distant pier, congregate to watch this day's sun go down. It lingers as it starts to slide, its shadows growing lingering longer that anything with light around its surface or location becomes prominent, craving the little light that will be left soon as the night evening approaches. Tonight, even the boats on the far horizon navigating closer toward land can be seen drifting homeward against the distant cliffs. And now the reddish-blue evening sunset appears, as white women with long tresses, graceful and seeming accomplished stroll calmly by. A final host of seagulls takes now to flight, a myriad, hearkening tones followed by a single commanding croak. The others have since gone seeking a sliver of sunlight, deep into the distant horizon but the sun is gone, and now, briefly so are they, as their distant semblance melts into the evening's misty horizon. All that is left is the mist, a cool breeze getting steadily cooler, fans and Santa Monica sands. Tuck stands. His meditation is over. He needs this. The multifarious concert of nature's many sounds, numerous sights, and indistinguishable noises, to lift him above humanity's moribund industry, creating in him a type of coherence. Each sound, even still each formed pattern that creates sound, means something to talk. He can hear the conversation the wind carries on with the sea, and the croaked criticism of the seagulls concerning the differentiated slap of the ocean's waves as it hits the infinitely beaten rocks. Only Tuck can hear this and respond. Tuck knows it is time to begin, time to perform for his fans, those who have steadily and faithfully congregated into an immense flocking of spectators, 10,000 deep, 10,000 strong about him, upon the sand. They traveled here to the Southern Californian beach to hear his music, the music of Tuck Snowdell. I want you to understand. I want to be able to build a bridge between many private worlds. A crossing like the cerebral corpus callosum carrying the things the sea says to your ears. Tonight, I will play this special piece that I have been composing in my mind since I was a child standing by my dear mother L'Oreal's side. People our purpose here is to be beautiful and to live in this time, not to be blinded by a lack of sight. How is it that I understand the flapping of wings and comic of the creatures as they vie for the best food and the tastiest morsel that comes from the ocean? I can only guess that it is a food chain, a form of right, a law that has the capacity to bind us all because, my beloved friends gathered here tonight, even you, Yes you, would consume the seagulls if the fruit chain chose to ensnare you perversely again. Then aloud in a bold voice, bolder than before any time in his 32 years of life, Ta cries out. A is a sound I keep close to my heart. It resonates through my very loins and makes me shudder. 
To me A is a single sound for a simple note, a single piece of enchanting music from 1 to 10 precious moments as the sound waves of our world pluck at its form. Now you all know the extent of my feelings, my essence, my signal. I communicate A often in my music. I cannot say why or how it came to me to be such a precious note, an essential of my symphony, the ensemble of the symphony I intend to play for you all here this evening. Tux fans appeared perplexed. They only desired to appreciate Tux music, they looked to one another for an explanation, a large group looked toward Jason, a popular music reporter, a super person, seemingly the best spokesperson to challenge Tark without being rude. Tark, my name is Jason. You must be aware that we all wonder how you create such music, such emotion in sound through note, and all you can tell us is a, Tark you tease your fans, your adoring fans. Look Tark. The weather this evening is wonderful. We think that even the gods find this evening agreeable beyond our knowledge of time before our humanity, and you Tark, they must find pleasure in the sounds from you. Please don't entreat us with a ruse, Tark. What do you mean by a? Jason, you need to ask my mother that question. She remains healthy, her soul being filled with passion for life, for the things that our people create. My ability to express myself through my music is my mother's special gift to me, a testament to my mother's enduring love deeply evident before my birth. I merely express through my music infinite appreciation for my gift, by using it with fervor daily, to create music that defines my own and nature's expressions of emotions. Like we use speech. Yes, Jason, just as you use speech. But Tark, how can someone speak through music? You get to a point, and you must stop, stop the playing and talk, true? No Jason, you may stop. You may arrive at a point that permits you to go no further. But I cannot. My music goes on to infinity like your letters, words, sentences, paragraphs go on and on. Are you the reincarnation of Beethoven? Ancients Jason, ancients, but they came close. That is why they stumbled becoming embroiled in drama, in scandal, and as it may seem, befalls all who desire to create music, an inevitable despair. Because they wanted their audience to understand, not just to enjoy, not just to feel, not just to experience, not just to remember, but to understand. But a paradox is a devious device. If the audience understands, really understand, then the code of silence between musician and audience is broken. What joy, frolic, and revelry would be revealed? There would be no need for a repeat performance. One performance, one full disclosure shows over. Jason that audience would not return the following night. There would be no repeat performance, no encore, no endless opening nights, because the audience has understood. Jason, for those musicians, audience ignorance being bliss had a monetary ring about it, like the clink of coffee change on the Santa Monica Pier. But all of nature will understand my music and that is why each piece I make will be performed by me once, and only once. Now we get it. So, what are you going to play for us tonight? Will you use A? A is a note, the sound of a mere thought in my music. Its role is as transient as its corresponding role in standardized English grammar. I want you all to be still. Allow the sea to sing. Here its waves unfurl like Russian dresses in the age of the Khazars. Now understand. Like a grain of sand is pointlessly produced if produced alone, stars seem sad, silently shimmering in the darkened night sky. They must glitter, reflecting their light lit aura off the molten carbon and smoldering white flame surface of one another. Enhancing our pleasure and tickling the innards of our desires, permitting a trembling feeling of awe. This is universal dependence, for are they not our distant kith and kin? This night was such as the heavens twinkled. Like a fragment of a harmony of sound created by the maestro of our time, musical magician, Tark Snowdell. And then Tark played, as if calling all nature's choirs to attention. 
Each vocal sound tap made from the delicate perceptive intonation of his cultured voice, like a bat's echolocation that seeks matter by defining the void, the emptiness, but here there is no void. Tonight, the object, nature itself, responds expressing a sound that cannot exist beside the sonar tone of talk sweet voice. Instead, it smashes into it creating a sensuous melody that raises his spectators' earlobes. Slipping through the auditory pads, leading to the brain's amygdala, there to perform a sweet solo song. Ultimately suing against the silence created by stunned neurons that can only serve up sounds of surreal peacefulness. Tark's audience is transcendent now, beside themselves in rapture, enjoying humanity's place amongst nature. And on play Tuck, the boy that L'Oreal of the MLR created in a bundle of love and now revealing the very essence of magic making in his music there on the Santa Monica beach, for the masses of all the spectators before him, that evening. Tuck's voice rises high to a soulful pitch as he raises his left hand waving his fingers. Then he thrusts his hand higher in a rapid trembling motion. Each finger now totally tasked and straightened momentarily to perform a music-making motion upon the rhythmic vibration of Maestro Tuck's steady voice. All fingers now in flux but for Tuck's thumbs. Each thumb bent inward at right angles, impressions of a uh, brushing, suddenly, his left hand across the space of the emitting sound of his voice, twice in quick succession as the seagulls return to perch on the sand dunes from out of the darkness in the horizon, opening their wings to their fullest span, wide, wider, and then gloriously, again before taking to flight. Wings flapping, whistling like clear clarinets as the waves rise and the wind blows like a soft flute. Tuck's right hand fingers accusingly point to the stars, making many heads in the audience turn and yearn. His entranced spectators outwardly sighing at this remarkable music in the making, causes the fabric of space-time to tremble warping in flux to a humming sound like the sound honey makes when heard by bees. Precisely at this moment the fabric of reality pops in a single spot exposing its virginity. Its innocence, lost to the music of Tark Snowdale. Passion in the outer voids where humankind is not permitted one of the micronet community traveled its vastness alone, in pain, her flesh aflame as she roamed endlessly untamed. On that same warm winter night moment in 2121, she heard Tuck's music at a distance, beyond our now, the now of the spectators, Tuck's iridescent audience, the orchestra, the birds, the sea creatures, and the ephemeral wind. And she stopped at that moment to listen to it, to find out where it came from with all its concordance, doubtlessness, and belief in beauty. And for the first time in seven decades, it seemed she heard her name, her story, her life. Such a gorgeous sound thought she, self de silver, enhanced, long-lived and numbered amongst the micronet community, the tragic twin of method, both of them descendants of the ancient Brazilian house of De Silva living now like her twin spouse Onyx had once done, on the surface skin of a wormhole, twisting with each click of each moment, her once human flesh about the strange surface of her home for the past seventy earth years, self's place of solace since a time so long ago she could know. Longer clearly recall until now, this very moment. The subtle melody of Tark's music bewitched self beyond her ability to resist its rhythmic pulse upon the sinew of her mind. His music caused each chord, each note, each rise of violin sounding string-like vibrations against the wind, or boom bellowing trombone surmounting even the glow of the moon, to alter her. To transform her so that a secret consciousness awakened in self to Silver's earthborn soul and she whirled her wormhole earthward to where Tark's music played, saw Tark and fell deeply in love. Self stood like a dream in front of Tark. Her eyes would not leave his face. All her attention was on Tark. The crowd, silenced in amazement stared in disbelief at the musician and what, they believed, his music had created. 
Sylph began to speak to Tark with warm words that complemented the gentle writhing flames that danced like a simple bonfire all over her unclothed skin. You, who are you? How did you know the motion of my heart or the beat of my soul? How? You are human. You are not like me. You cannot exist beside me and our love, for that is the music you played minstrel magician, it has failed before it has even begun. Your lips cannot be against mine for I have been hurt by your kind, torn from feelings of caring and kindness before you were born, whatever kind of human you are. But the truth is that in this moment you are the man I have fallen in love with, though, too human, minstrel, musical magician, sweet thief of my enhanced soul. I do not know you so tell me how, how were you able to see so far back into a time when I was abused for being me, so beautiful, so exceptional, and so full of compassion? And then how could you see until this moment, my exile, and my silence? Who are you human? Because of you I know tears and I feel the sting of my exile from the earth that bore me. Would you be with me? caressing my fiery flesh that adorns this soul, this soul that has been stripped of humanity and now exists beyond the reach, until this time before I was certain of one like you? Hurry, for my heart yearns to know though my mind knows a multitude of nameless fears for our tomorrow and the times we will make our own as each minuscule moment weaves the music of this love that you have uncovered into a sweet song, replete with star touch affections. Your name musical minstrel magician, come closer and tell me. Tak stepped forward. He forgot his audience, he forgot the sea, the seagulls and the twinkling evening stars suspended above the Santa Monica beach. He was only aware of her. He could feel the warmth of her skin, but love robbed him of his sense of peril. Imbued with concealed courage he answered her. Fiery creature. You have appeared from my music, and you ask me my name. I am Tark, Tark Snowdell. This very moment is peculiar to me, am I sleeping or am I wide awake? Is this death? Perhaps it is another time that steals my masterly moment of majestic musical triumph. Or, is it just a shamanic dream, a strange dream stupid young men like me experience as part of a bargain before the adulthood sorrows of life ensue? You astonishing creature, you trap the essence of my demure, my deepest desire. You will be my ultimate act of selfish obsession. An act in gratitude of total absorption against the moment, around, in, and throughout that moment when a man believes erroneously that faith is God-given grace, but deceived by the transient nature of his own thought is man. Tonight, I am not deceived by this merciful golden gift, that is you, fiery creature, perfect creature made mine immediately the moment I declared my name. Don't you know that I crave for your name, like people crave justice and hearts crave moments? Come, before you tell me, take my hand. I do not fear your fiery flesh. I am in love with you creature, I know this now and it will be so for all time. Or if you prefer to consume me in kissing flame before you take my hand and reveal your name, tell me now so that I can scream my love for you before I die and the flames that danced all over her skin softened. Sylph smiled saying, I am Sylph the Silver, enhanced, one of the Micronet community. Exiled by your kind, before your time when my birth was considered an evil. My twin brother Method and I searched for the birthplace of our will that your kind called a soul, and found it in a place called Eranto, in Brazil. Tark Snowdell, listen well, I, Sylph the Silver, am yours now because your music wove us into this profound love. Philosophy Years elapsed and finally autumn fell out of minds, as a crisper air chilled the rosy cheeks of happy children, so much crisper this year that even Californian children, with Christmas expectations upon the prefrontal cortex of their minds, felt a shifting shaft of northern draft. The Christmas holiday was cold soul deterrent in the final throes of the fast-fading year of 2125. 
It was during this time that sweet Silesia and starry-eyed Shaw, Organet twins, very special twins, were born to Sulf and Tark. Their destiny transcended this moment, all the way to the city-state of Kratel and the Kratolian community on the ice moon Enceladus, where many enhanced peoples of the age of the Micronet settled after quitting Earth between the years 2050 and 2075. The Micronet community consisted of humans and the enhanced as they were called. The enhanced members of the Micronet community could choose between remaining on Earth and relocating to Kratel. The human members of the Micronet community were the parents or relatives of the enhanced who chose to be counted amongst the Micronet community because they loved their enhanced skin. They could not live in Kratel because they were not enhanced. Instead, they set up communities on Earth and were subject to the first principle laws passed to ensure human preservation first and foremost before all creatures or creations. The enhanced members of the Micronet community had received an MI, Micronet brain implant, within 18 months after birth. By age 5 the Micronet brain implant gave them access to conventional web-based networks by using their minds to access network service providers wirelessly, however the download speeds of conventional internets were much too slow for them. This led to the creation of the Micronet Service Provider or as it was often called, the MSP, which enabled them to download data 1000 times faster than conventional network service providers. Organets are the children of the Micronet community. They did not receive Micronet brain implants in their infancy. Only one parent needed to have a Micronet brain implant for their child's DNA to develop the ability to access Micronet technology organically. The enhanced members of the Micronet community and their offspring, Organets, were different to humans in other ways too. One of these differences led to their migration to the Enceladian city Kratel. The enhanced members of the Micronet community possessed lifespans reaching up to 300 years and in some cases longer. Organets live even longer than their parents however there is no official record of the lifespan of an organet or in fact even of an enhanced member of the Micronet community. What we know regarding the Micronet community comes from the data we recovered from the scientists who created the Micronet brain implant and from the first citizen of Kratel, Diana Tapp, former CEO of the TAP Consortium. Even the Micronet community is astonished at the abilities that their organet offspring have. Silesia and Shra were destined to rule the organet cities of the asteroid belt Alpha Centauri. One of the choices provided to citizens of the modern life rail was to either experience the changing of the seasons or not. Life-affirming L'Oreal Snowdell chose the former. That afternoon I was a special guest, although she was unaware of this fact, as the MLR entered the service centers of the British Midlands. At university I remembered reading that the money, influence, and manufacturing muscle of old Birmingham business historically capitalized the Midland cartels whose lineage dated back to the 18th century and the very beginnings of the British Industrial Revolution. It could be said that pioneering manufacturers like Robert Owen inspired this part of the British Isles to become heads of industry. I was getting used to the snaking motion of the train I stood on, I was quite enjoying it. A moment just passed back in my time, I charmed a nice young lady at the time travel office in Kensington into granting me a license for two more time travel trips. My time travel passport had collected eight stamps all of which were for trips to the future to visit the Snowdell family, whom I had grown quite fond of. The time travel guidelines were quite explicit when it came to total number of time travel trips per week permitted for civilians so as not to become addictive. The kind young lady questioned me and although I didn't mean to, I somehow let it slip that my father was the British ambassador Ronan Clark. Well, after that fact emerged, I let her do the thinking followed by the talking. Dad was a hero, he was considered a national treasure back in my time. It was quite enlightening watching a person jump to all kinds of conclusions. As soon as the nice young lady at the travel office realized who my father was, she authorized two more time travel trips for me. She somehow seemed to convince herself that I was on top secret government business. 
it didn't seem right for me to burst her bubble. I had one more trip left after this one. This time, L'Oreal looked much older. It was fascinating how in the space of one week, she had aged in my eyes. She was a mature woman now I had not spoken to her since before Tark was born. Seeing her was another story, as I said I used up most of my time travel visits to observe the Snowdell family. In the space of a week in my time 30 years seemed to have passed by in L'Oreal's time. It was astonishing, but again we were warned about the space-time dilation that affects the flow of time from one place in time relative to another. A few minutes here could be a lifetime there. They warned us not to interfere. It's just tough stopping oneself from feeling attached. Well, no time to waste if I wanted to continue feeling attached. I told myself. Hey L'Oreal, how are things? She looked at me strangely, then turned away toward the entrance to the Info Memory Galleria. I felt like a stranger. For a moment I thought she had forgotten me. I was about to walk away when L'Oreal swung back around to address me. I thought you were a stranger. How have you been time traveler? It's been a while. Hello L'Oreal. That it has. I replied avoiding any reference to the obvious and my, how you've aged remark. She stared at me, scrutinizing me for evidence of productive potential. I extended my hand then pulled it back after remembering being reprimanded for interfering with foreign bodies located in a future. L'Oreal noticed. She rolled her eyes like a no-nonsense New York woman and started talking. They say that we are in danger of disappearing, the last of our kind. What do you believe? Sometimes the smooth rattle of the modern life rail lulls me into a semi-conscious state. Sometimes I find it hard to think beyond the moment. I considered her eyes, not sure what I wanted to find. She smiled wider, displaying beautiful, ivory white teeth. Is this new to you, the feeling of constant focus on one's immediate environment? She placed the books on the countertop carefully, checking to make sure all five were there. You know it is, I confirmed. I bet you never thought we would come to this. Is getting old really that bad? I blurted out, allowing my eyes to drop toward the ground, embarrassed by my own mouth. There's no need to be ashamed. Getting old is not too bad, better than some say it is, actually. But I imagine even in your time, young people who do not experience it also talk so insensitively. For a moment I missed the point then it sunk like an anchor in my mind. She spotted acquiescence in my stare and continued. Honestly, I don't want life to go so damn fast. I am stubborn. Is that something you can relate to? You would not have been able to travel through time to be here if your society did not relate to such abstinence. It would be that type of stubbornness that drove you to constantly chase such a wondrous, technological dream. All of you would have stayed put in your time instead of finding a way to travel to ours. It took practiced restraint for me not to reply, the type of restraint that could be seen throughout my entire being, like Rasputin's better half, holding his tongue and allowing destiny to run its own course. If it were not for all the experience, I had gained traveling back through the years, meeting here on the MLR with L'Oreal, getting to know her, I never would have learned when to reply and when to bide my time, and just listen. L'Oreal was at ease with my presence, however, showing no signs of even sensing my inner struggle to remain silent. She carefully inserted each book into its proper place in the collection suspended in mid-air shelves of colored glass light design in the gallery and continued her musings. You know, I can tell that you have seen my talk. I can sense it. I raised an eyebrow at the sound of Tark's name. Amazing, isn't he? I talk about him every moment of every day. I find reasons to talk about him and insert him in every conversation in every way possible. Can I tell you a silly secret? L'Oreal was about to slide a book back between two very chunky volumes concerning the rise of the tap consortium on one side and the autobiography, Why I Spied With My Little Eye, by former British Ambassador Lord Roman Clark, but she pulled back instead moving almost intimately closer to me. 
Promise not to repeat it, time traveler. I nodded reassuringly but was somewhat distracted by the book by former British ambassador Lord Clark, my dad who was healthy the last time I saw him and to my knowledge had not written that book yet or been knighted by our good King Harry the current Queen Elixir's father. Metaphorically speaking, an angel appeared on one shoulder with the travel guide rule book and the devil on the other pointing his red hot trident shaped tail at the book my dad had written. That book was better than a fortune cookie and worth much more, I mused. I was intrigued. I glanced at L'Oreal to get her spatial position before executing a book grab. She hadn't noticed my ill intentions toward possessing that book. Instead, she responded. Okay, thank you. She released a chunky volume clumsily. The book flashed quickly past my face, granting me just enough time to avoid coming into direct contact. The close encounter with a hard book volume in the future could have given me many sleepless nights. That was close, I said, reminding L'Oreal of the delicate ripple in space-time we just prevented from occurring. Yikes. Sorry. Tark will always be my baby. I rolled my eyes back in my head then switched my attentions to that book by my dad which seemed to me to have more accuracy about the future when read in my time, than any new edition Bible. I know you didn't need to travel to my time to tell me that Tark is a grown man. It was true I had seen Tark. I was getting rather sophisticated at time travel. I had made many trips to Santa Monica to observe Tark and his family just this week alone. I watched him at university, then at his debut concert on Santa Monica Beach, the day he met his wife. I felt a connection to him. I would always watch him from a safe distance. I, I just can't help myself. Just the sound of Tark's name moves my heart and I feel so much love toward what I took part in creating. I moved closer to her. This time I could not resist a minor act of interfering in the future. L'Oreal, you raised an amazing child who has quite a remarkable family with gorgeous twin girls. Have you seen them? No, I have not seen Tark's family. Do you know their names? Her eyes showed sadness in them like those of a puppy briefly separated from its owner. I told her their names. Silesia and Shra. How beautiful. Thank you. I really look forward to seeing Tark and his family, but I feel nervous traveling outside of Train City to California. Who would have thought people could spend every minute of their entire lives on a train? I see you too, have aged somewhat. No, I haven't, I disputed with a cringed expression. Yes, you have but so have I. Do you ever wonder how your age travels through time with you right to where you are now? It did not take you long to get to the age that you are now, because it took you no time to get here from there and look how your years followed you with ease. Excuse me? I looked at her in utter confusion. You don't have to answer if you don't know. I felt relief not having to answer something for which I had no response and headed toward one of the huge arching glass screen panels, aware that L'Oreal was watching my every move. I stood there motionless as the color swooshed by, forming a psychedelic blur due to the train's intermittent burst of high speed. I had become used to the dichotomy of the future to my present. The swirling shades thrilled me. I felt sorry for so many people back in my time that would never get to experience anything like this. That book popped back into my mind. I caught my reflection in a discreet place staring back at me and almost screamed in horror. I had aged. I looked older than I felt and yelled out. What the hell? L'Oreal jumped, thinking I was talking to her. It was just wistful thoughts. I was just thinking, wondering, my last pleasure in the refuge of my own mind. You must realize by now that we all need help as we all grow old. I think the dreams of the young are worth all our adulthood struggles to support them. How so, L'Oreal? I was committed to giving Tark an upbringing and a good education. I knew I was putting my trust in the world when my Tark left the MLR to go to university. She smiled proudly when she said this. 
It sounded good and I was right by her side instead pointing at my face in a two-handed self-directed finger jabbing motion like I had just caught something life-threatening. It has been a year since I have seen Tark. Is he well? I don't care was my first thought, but instead I yelled out. I'm OLD. I didn't know what else to say. Are you okay? No. I'm old. I answered like a suburban brat. Of course, you are. Why? Because you exist relative to your surroundings. What? Universal dependence, probably called the theory of general relativity by Albert Einstein. Why didn't someone tell me? I assumed you would have read about it in your time travel guide. Your first visit calibrates your subsequent visits to avoid confusing those who live in your future. You thought you could remain young here. I cannot be expected to read everything. You should. Well, have you seen him? Yes. I gave in, betraying a strain of tension in my face. Why that look? I didn't know how to answer. Instead, I asked. When was the last time you saw him? Like I said, a year has passed since I have seen him. He visited me last January. He said he had traveled on the Hyperloop from New York to London. He told me how exciting it was to travel from New York to London in less than an hour. He said I should try it, but I don't know about that, she replied solemnly. It's been a while then. I know. I know. You don't have to remind me. Twins, wow. Gorgeous girls, you say. How sweet. Have you seen them? A mother doesn't care, you know, because the light in a mother's heart remains bright, always penetrating any sense of darkness that may grab her and cause her to worry needlessly, quite unnecessarily, about her child. I couldn't help myself. I just stared at her. Stop that. What? That look again. My eyes fell away from her gaze. What is it about? I turned away. Thwack. I turned quickly at the sound of a book hitting the back wall. It slid firmly between a gap. Fine, have it your own way. Don't tell me. But you look like you want to. Are you bursting inside, wanting to tell me, time traveler? Is something happening in your time? Even if it seems important, it will be all right. Suddenly I looked up, feeling as if I were a ray of light in a dark corner, liberating its surroundings. Don't laugh at me. You can smile. Tell me. Tell me now, right in this moment. Still, I hesitated. If I wanted to, I could just look it up now right here in the Info Memory Galleria. We house all important events leading up to and through Wartech. I am easily able to find out what concerns you and causes you to worry so. The space between us began to grow. L'Oreal picked up another book, A Painted Marriage by the 21st Century Feminist Artist Shani Majel and looked at its beautiful front cover. A moment passed. Her tone became reflective. I was thinking about why I never married or dated much either. There was someone. A beautiful young man whom I adored. I still do. But I think our time has passed. Do you believe that love is blind to the things we value? I have never thought about it. You think any love I had for this man, had it blossomed, would have been pointless because my heart and soul and all the energy I possessed would have been poured into Tark. Are you talking about me L'Oreal? I said allowing the colors of my face to drain this was more personal and I felt uncomfortable, so I began mimicking the British sky with its frequent switches in appearance from sunny and bright to grey and overcast. Obviously, I was not successful at it because L'Oreal considered my eyes. There's that look again. Frustrated. I asked. What, L'Oreal? What's the matter with you? What do you want me to say? You know there are lines I am not permitted to cross, lest I interfere. 
But you are being strange and making me uncomfortable. I am making you uncomfortable. I asked, dripping with sarcasm. She opened a book and was greeted by a painting of a basket replete with fruit and vegetable. It is Wednesday. I must get some organic fresh produce. My neighborhood is against it. They say that for the organic produce to be healthier, it would need to be grown outside of the environment where current fruit and vegetables come from. I recognized the complete shift in subject and wondered if I felt genuine curiosity about how the MLR obtained organic produce or if I had just been ensnared again in one of L'Oreal's futuristic philosophical conversations. It felt like a day trip in quicksand. In a convoluted manner, I asked L'Oreal about the price of fresh groceries. I knew I shouldn't have. L'Oreal smiled. I think she believed I was becoming more pliable, more willing to come around to her way of thinking. You are asking if it is expensive, right? Oh, I see. You grew up under a different sky from me, so you have no idea of the cost of shopping today. I like to shop every Wednesday because that is the only day the fresh produce is truly fresh. Honestly. Whenever we stop at a city or a town along our way, we collect organic fresh produce. Is it expensive? You must be either a capitalist or an economist, where Fabians lie concealed, or you would not ask about the price. I dabbled, but not to that extent. Have you heard the principal environment surrounding civilization being the signature of its will? Yes, indeed. Who hasn't? I replied with an adamant expression of sophistication emerging on my face. Good. I always wondered why they started teaching this principle in schools because my teachers constantly repeated it to us whilst explaining every single word until some of the instructors were quite red in their faces or simply exhausted. I remember that there was a teacher from Pakistan who was quite pale in complexion after spending three hours explaining every word in detail with diagrams drawn with his fingertips upon the Islab. No way. Seriously? Yes, seriously. He would continue until each of us stared at him like digital children recently programmed for success. What do you think of the principle? I haven't discussed that principle in a long time. Since my undergraduate days at Nottingham University, in fact. No opinion. It was one of a million principles I studied back in the day. A million principles time traveler. Okay, various principles. I guess you have not seen it in practice and must believe it is idealistic. I ignored her assertion instead pointing to the book by Lord Ronan Clark. My dad's picture on the book's spine bore a resemblance to me. L'Oreal did not notice. It's not. Take a look at. Wait. Wait. Look around you. Look outside that window over there. Go on, quickly before the MLR picks up speed. See it. See them. Look closely. Really, really look, nice. I was amazed, I did not expect to find everyone and everything looking so healthy and pristine. You got them to be quite the sage L'Oreal. I know, I know that I have become too philosophical as I have gotten older. I have been studying metaphysics. Major minds from your times discuss immortality, but I still find it hard to understand what they are talking about. And the Micronet community is proof that we can live longer than we currently do, but still, they are mortal. They will die like the rest of us when their ability to trap energy is spent. L'Oreal, I am trying to show you something. I am sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. It doesn't mean that life is not worth living. It's just that life is all about living now, or in your case now and there. I get it. Okay, so back to the principle. Environment surrounding civilization is the signature of its will. I thought you, of all people would understand what it means. But you look like you don't believe me. I know that all my life I have been on the MLR, but that doesn't mean I am shallow. 
Just because I have not touched the sun it doesn't mean that I cannot believe or understand that it burns. I could feel myself starting to fume. Hold on, hold on. I like when you get frustrated. Your face goes blank then your forehead tenses and I can see the shape of your focus. She may have been happy, but she could tell I was far from it. Okay, okay I will get on with it. Here goes. But that look again. You want to tell me something, but you think it will hurt me. Now I determinedly walked toward the book by Lord Ronan Clark. I knew it was illegal for time travelers to interfere with the future, but I had become fond of L'Oreal. In my mind I asked myself is it an act of love to change the course of L'Oreal's future or a selfish need to avoid my own emotional pain. L'Oreal, back turned, still staring at the painted produce picture page, and missed my actions. My life and expectations are limited. I know I talk a lot. I also think a lot. It's all the information we have access to in the Info Memory Galleria. It makes your brain buzz. It's like an electrical current, power, rushing through your neurons. She looked up. I looked around and met her stare, slightly perturbed. You look. What's the word, exasperated? Maybe you are ready so I will explain. Here goes. The environment is your immediate knowledge. That is everything you know. Everything that you have learned whether you are aware of it or not. Everything in your life up to this very moment, this very instant, that is surrounding you, this is your environment. Civilization is you plus one person or more people. It cannot just be you. It means it must exist and experience life. The signature is the mark that is left by you, your memories, your words, your actions, and everything you own. It is proof. A record that you did in fact exist, that you were here. It identifies you or another, or me plus one or more person, to any other person looking at you or me, or you plus one or more person. The observer is plus one or in other words the other persons who experience your existence like your family and friends. The signature is the mark that cannot be erased. It carries essential character, history, and personality, so it is an identity. The final two, of means beginning or the starting point, it is the same as starting and it is the link from the signature to the environment that is you plus one or more person to someone that is not me or you, this is what we call to be part of a community. Finally, will is that thing, soul, if you prefer, or even spirit, that is brought with us into this world. I read this in a book that I found in the Info Memory Galleria explaining where the will comes from. The writer used commentary concerning publicly available factual accounts from Wartek conversations that took place between the former Empress of Africa, Shadu Shahola, where the Empress and war reporters referenced this principle during interviews. From their understanding, they explained that the will must come first and consciousness second and so to know one's own will as early as possible upon birth into this world, is the most important task that we, as humans, can accomplish. I believe the will, as it was described in this book, is the actual essence of the thing, its mark and its spiritual code, its truest identity in all places, not just here, but everywhere, or as the new gods say, in all worlds, regardless of whether the form it takes is organic or inorganic. So, when more than one will comes together or is present, the environment goes through a kind of melting pot scenario, that concocts a new or different essence, atmosphere, based on the collective will of the people. This is very different from the will of the individual, instead it is the result of the blended will of many people that forms our atmosphere, essentially, our harmony, our community. Environment surrounding civilization is the signature of its will. It describes the harmony that you see when you look outside the modern life rail to see all the healthy faces, communities, and pristine buildings. You wonder why we are like this. It's because our collective will work together to keep the blessings of our earth in trust to the benefit of all of us.
we are the trustees and beneficiaries of the creation of our own harmony. In other words time traveler, we created this world we inhabit. I turned away from the book by my father Lord Clark and came back to where L'Oreal stood and pointed to the title of another book in her pile. Wartech, what about it? The last great war was Wartech right? That was 70 years ago and there has been no war on earth since then. It's not a utopian dream, but what would you prefer, the alternative? I nodded disagreeing. I thought not. You are seeking utopia. Isn't that why you are here? Observing, absorbing, evolving because of the conscious choice of utopia instead of war you are here. The look again. It's Tark isn't it? Now I was unable to avoid answering. I was entrapped. Yes, it's Tark. He is not dead. I would know. I would feel it. But it is something serious. That look, or is it the mother of the twins? I have never met her. What is she like, Sylph? That name sounds very familiar. Where is she from? I don't know. I answered. It was an honest answer. What do you mean you don't know where she is from? She must be from planet Earth, right? I don't recall hearing about human off-planet colonization being achieved. Is she American? And then suddenly I felt her futuristic mind in mine and L'Oreal understood all I had kept from her in the last refuge of my mind. No way, she cannot be from the Micronet community. All things have gravity, not just planets. I recalled hearing my father, Lord Ronan Clark, say this when I was a teenager. Suddenly, L'Oreal's body went limp. I caught her in my arms. The warmth from her body felt at home in mine. And, in that moment, my entire future changed. Thank you. I don't know what happened. It must have been what you were saying. You said this silk woman is from the Micronet community, isn't that what you said? No L'Oreal, I never said that. You read my mind and learned of it that way. You never introduced yourself to me, time traveler. I remember the first thing you said to me was, what are you sitting on? Don't you think an introduction is well overdue my time traveling friend? I was still holding her gently in my arms. My name is Luthien Clark, my father is Lord Ronan Clark. I wanted to kiss her, but she recovered just enough to be independent. The moment passed. Now I do remember that name. Luthien, time traveler, you know Sylph's name more than I do because her crimes, I know, are still being felt in your society. But my Tark, how could my Tark and this Sylph come together? Tark is too young for her. Yet you tell me that this Sylph has not been seen on Earth in at least 70 years. And that it was reported that she and her twin brother simply vanished after their escape from captivity. You must be mistaken. What is the real name, the name of Tark's wife? She is from Earth but where on Earth she came from I honestly don't know. Her formal name is Sylph D.A. Silva, enhanced twin sister of Metho D.A. Silva, both from the Micronet community and both exiled from Earth in 2043. My father became a national hero after famously capturing Sylph at Heathrow Airport in the year 2042. She was awaiting trial for multiple assassinations and terrible crimes against humanity but escaped from jail leaving a trail of devastation in London city centre after she destroyed Paddington Green's high security police station with the help of her twin brother and his spouse, Onyx, who also is a member of the Micronet community. They were rumoured to be living in alternative dimensions far from the reach of human law enforcement, however my father investigated her past and uncovered evidence of very high-level conspiracy and espionage that led to historic changes in our society. I am sorry L'Oreal, it is true. Don't tell me that. Luthien, there is more, I know. Outside looks wild, well wilder than it did a moment just past. I was going to Birmingham's bull ring to shop. The MLR is scheduled to arrive there in two hours. 
I must get ready, but I don't feel like it now, time traveler. Come walk with me and you can tell me in your own words what that look really means, please. I appreciate your time. You were always the most beautiful person in my life. Tark is the most beautiful person to come out of my life. There is a difference, you know. Come Luthien, let's walk. The end of part 3. The Music of Tark Snowdle Based on the novel Tark By Mark Miller Copyright 2023 Author Name All Rights Reserved Part 4 Despair In the waning fall of 2125 self, the silver lay upon the edge of what seemed to her like a void and complained aloud. My brother, my twin if you were to see me now, what would you say? We have lived long lives and I have learned that the length of our lives, latest live, is but a fraction of life left to live. Look at me, me, self, unloving of humankind yet still irony has supplanted my proud pomp with precious human fortune delivered from out of my womb. This emotion is strange to me and the cause of it, even stranger, for I have had a reputation tainted as being resolute as smelt steel. Scourge of humanity, I was once called in this place where I now lay back, slowly, prepared knowing that female pain of extension into life's places where man will never be able to go. But where is my human love in this dawning moment? Your foolish lily, Sylph. Now to watch and listen to myself cry out for a human, my human, Tark, whose magical music heals broken hearts from far away. My heart is well and the twins I carried were bold presents, a thank you of sorts, a mark of Tark, the standard bearer of our love. I love Tark despite his humaneness. I love Tark despite his kind torment of my brother and me. I love Tark, but my love reveals none of the reasons why. To me it just lifts me up and brings me swiftly to a place that I cannot seriously seek to turn and walk away from. Tark is my pleasure although I accept this, why will be an eternal mystery to me. I will not question its essence, as its parts in pieces would mean nothing to me, no more than the enormity of its revelation does. My love for Tark wrought the very space around its objects, giving space character, individuality, that essence called our love. And Tark and I allowed that essence to seep into each space in our joined mass everywhere there is spare space in which to seep. We are merely vessels for our love which is equal and absolute to the visible and invisible essence of our bodies. I knew my love, our love might kill Tark, but I would choose that Tark dies knowing my love, producing our love, leaving to our twins a love, our love that is unique, beautiful, and pure. My Tark will die for me. I think he had a choice, but I did not have a choice, so, how could he? So Tark was marked for death before he suspected our love's payment was to be his precious life. I cannot conceal my tears for this man whom I love. 
What would my brother say upon seeing his sister with tears in her eyes, tears that were for a human? My whole life I have had a desire to be accepted as human even though I was born here. Never once considering myself to be human and now I am in love with one. The realization that this human my tart will die, leaving our love sundered, he distraught does this service, darkly describing destiny's doom in these day's tatty moments. I want tart near me. I will be greedy, forgetting the many decades of my exile, loss, and loneliness and final metamorphosis into a creature existing on the surface of a wormhole. I am not sorry, Tark. Not for our love, never for our love. But sad, yes, sad because the price for our love is life itself and I mean immediately to go with you into the unknown your kind called death. But who would remain to parent our children that we will leave behind, our children our love? Then your loneliness is complete dark utterly. The future doesn't appear to offer a measure of mercy or pity. Oh Tark, I perceive your magical music has charmed more than me, but death itself, if such a form, a law can exist. Death, it seems has conspired to take you quickly to satiate its own dark desire. My enhanced thoughts are disjointed yet it seems my logic has some chaotic accuracy. Tark, death has heard your music and death's desire seems to me clear and unsullied. My desire is simple, to love you and become a part of you. Death's design outsmarted both our vigilant thoughts, and death's reasons unable to be heard by both human and enhanced, is such steely irony. Tark, after you die, I will never see you again. Oh why? Why must my only compensation be the beautiful booty born of this proud belly? Life Of all the great British places in early 2126 that affected the senses, it was said that the modern life rail numbered amongst the most potent. Places resonate better in us when attached to interesting faces that guide us to such breathtaking ingenuity, permitting the mind a brief respite and indulgence against that which would consume humanity and plant it firmly in one place like trees and plants. It appears that we are blessed by that thing that journeyed into the here and now, endearing us with the evolving ability to give concrete credence to our most outlandish and ridiculously transcendent thoughts. And so, the product of aspiring thought from a lowly human, although brilliant, from the former Transvaal in southern Africa, stepped upon the very threshold of the skull section of the modern life rail. She was smoking hot. She adjusted her attire. Cooled herself and cooled herself even more concealing her fiery flesh beneath modern jeans and a white lace, fully indulgent embroidered blouse by Joffa Major, both entered upon the MLR. Self de Silva's hair was left unkempt. It was a symbol, a mark of endearing respect to Self's mother, Mia Alda de Mendoza a forgotten street child from a forgotten place called Iranto in Brazil, both mother and place long since gone. Self's sizzling eyes saw the door. Recalling her haste, Self approached the door with little delay and stood before it, not altogether patiently. You are Self. How do you know my name? You wear my son's smile and proudly too. Then it is you I seek, because you are my Tark's mother. Yes Sylph, I am L'Oreal Snowdell, and this place is the modern life rail that you have arrived on. Mler, this human contraption created by chance. L'Oreal Snowdell, I think I will now call you mother because my errand is that of a daughter to a mother with a bitter pang of love in dire danger as my soul acts. Sylph, the people of the MLR seek comforts that others call unique. We are simple in most things almost bland, but what can we do that endears us to strangers? Nothing we think, but to maintain some friendly encouragement toward guests and visitors without appearing too weak. My love's mother, can you understand my mind? I am not numbered amongst your kind, yet I am ensnared in the destiny of your race. 
I do not seek your forgiveness because to offer apology for the actions of we the Micronet community exists outside of what we accept as being our essence. My love's mother, I am of a mind to act in a way that gives no offense to you. Therefore, I call upon you in earnest, in respect of the happiness and precious fortune that the fruit of your womb has granted me. Sylph, you are a haughty stranger to this time, to this peace, love in place. Clearly, I can see this, but your words do make me feel some comfort in the fact that our meeting regards matters of love and not hate. Mother, place your person by my side and grant me access to a place within your odd abode that we may talk. Come Sylph, follow me, we can speak in the Info Memory Galleria. I find a lot of comfort here amongst the many memories of humankind. Mother, human memories leave me feeling cold, such that they cause in my thoughts a feeling of sadness. Tark's time with me cured my often harsh feelings toward your race. But Sylph, you were born here, correct? Yes, mother, but that was a very long time ago, before even you were born. Our decay is slow. Yet you seem so young. We have more knowledge of time than your kind does. Sylph, our kind has evolved a lot since you last inhabited this earth. Never will the race of humans overtake those of the Micronet community. Sylph, achievement is merely a positive state of mind, not agreement in kind. Even within the Micronet community some see this as true. Mother, you twist the urgency of my errand around word games. We are of the MLR. Our minds do not connect with places but with memories, because memory means our minds are much keener than those of our neighbors outside the modern life rail. Then mother of my love, my errand is not vain and your advice is well sought. That look. You too. What is it? Mother. I wanted to bring with me your grandchildren, Silesia and Shra, but I was unsure of the nature of the reception we would receive, so thought to spare them heartache as a mother is moved to do. I came alone. I see Sylph, criminal or not as they say you are, you still behave like one of us, with your indecision. Are you sure that you are not one of us? My mind's scars bear testimony to my kind. I am not human and do not wish to be, for I have seen things and places that are beyond the very limits that your kind is able to know. Yet, I cannot present a single fact of that knowledge to you here because it would mean absolutely nothing to a human. No, you cannot be human. You don't have a sense of humor. The place I once inhabited needed none. Um, okay. Mother, see me for what I am. Then any offense you feel will be softened. It is merely my nature to allow my will to rage. This is the signature of the enhanced. Yes, but what brought you here? Sit there if you can and I will sit here. Good, we will both have a view of the beautiful London skyline as the MLR passes it by. Tark, my love will die. Oh no. Now I know the meaning behind that look. Foreboding. I cannot, I just don't understand. Why, why? Tark was healthy when he left here to live in Santa Monica. His music heals hearts. It is beautiful beyond any that this world has ever heard. To say that this world will never ever hear such music played again. I don't know what this means. Your news hurts my heart so much that I must, before I accept your sullen words, know why. Because of Tark's love for me. Feel my flesh. It is hot. Hotter than your kind can caress and not hope to perish because of it. My enhanced DNA preys relentlessly upon Tark's genes. Woman, should we continue this conversation? Mother, let me describe the nature of the love Tark and I share. The essence that Tark and I allowed to grow is of such sweetness that its price could only ever have been a swift death. Sylph, I still do not understand. 
yet you will live like a shadow if my tart were to die. And so, I seek, unknown to tart the heart of his sweet childhood environment that still gladly persists in this place. You, mother, you will I believe, aid me. In what, woman? The defeat of death itself. You, Sylph are mad. Yes, mad, madly in love with your son and to see his departure from this place will make me wish to leave too. And what of your grandchildren, the twins, Silesia and Shra? These special twins' mother will lose both parents. And their futures will be blighted and that love I can see now clearly that you cherish will be vanquished beyond the greatest attempt at restitution. Cute words woman, Sylph, now daughter. I see you would share my son's fate and then my loss would be deepened. You can only be my daughter in this moment because your love has no creases, no cracks. No doubt and that makes you one with my son, and so the love I cherish for Tark now is equally yours too. Still, all I know of you is that which I have learnt in this info memory galleria. Sylph, the signature of your will in our world is sinister. Mother, I warned Tart before our first kiss, before our first embrace, and still Tart persisted like lava shooting to the very top and beyond the tip of a volcano, not caring that it would become rock and smolder no more. Yes, I understand now. All the memories that I have absorbed during my life on the MLR, suddenly have meaning even if for a moment in which their knowledge is revealed. You must truly know the essence of my son who you love. Tark is the very music he plays. When Tark makes and then plays music, he can plot any course and achieve it. But death, I would say is beyond even the magical music of my son. Tark's music is life and death rests upon the opposite side of life and between life and death a higher plane must exist, where it is, and it is not. Here exists the state of being, both alive and dead, festering as one. Philosophers call this place immortality, the epistemological center of knowledge, where all forms can never be fixed in permanence. Sylph, though impossible for most, I believe to overcome death, Tark must become immortal. But my death is still assured. Still, I cannot seek delay another day. What if the roles were reversed and Tark cries whilst I die? Sacrifice for love's sake. Then you must seek it for both of you because you were willing to follow Tark into death. Now follow Tark beyond both life and death. Mother, it is now my place to ask, but what of the twins? My dear son Tark must compose the magical music of immortality. Before you do this, you must bring the twins to me. The words of a bold single parent on the MLR have set in motion a scenario that might spiral human and enhanced kind into immortality. Or it might confirm our failure to achieve immortality. We may find that outside of consciousness there is nothing awaiting any of us. Death Santa Monica, January 21, 26 a gorgeous morning crept through the windows in Sylph and Tark's home. Sylph, Silesia and Shra had left home early to catch the sunrise down at the beach, and if they were lucky, a whale, dolphin, or seal frolicking between the crest of the daybreak waves. Unbeknownst to Tark, Sylph decided today she would take the twins to L'Oreal Snowdale. Tark was becoming weaker, with each passing moment. He eased himself out of bed, downstairs, over to his desk, and into the chair that complemented it. Oh hello. Who are you? Have we met before? Your vibrations seem familiar. I answered as the room brightened with each elevation of the sun. You know my mother? That is refreshing to know, but what are you doing here? I am worried about you. So. You heard my thoughts and know I will die. I was just writing a note for the future. Are you planning to see your mother? Yes, I look forward to seeing my mother again before I... 
I prevented Tark from finishing his sentence instead driving the moment toward a specific topic, the music of Tark's Nodel. Yes, I still make music. Music is the essence of my soul. I cannot stop making music. I expect to continue making music after I have departed from this life. I shook my head in agreement. Tark stared at me. He knew me. I could see it in his sullen eyes although he had never spoken to me before. He was aware of my existence, of my history, of my ability to travel through time from the stories his mother had told him when he was a child. Can I ask you a question? My eyes invited him to do so as his eyes inevitably met mine. Thank you. We were interrupted by loud, happy barking as their neighbor's dog, a golden spaniel, ran into the house. Not another potential breach of the time travel rules, I thought to myself. I was already paying two fines for interference incidences during my visits to L'Oreal Snowdell. Affection for people in the future was getting pricey. Stop Sam, stop. They are not here. They went to the beach. Sam ran over to Tark to get some love. Tark lifted his frail right hand and ran it through the fur on Sam's neck. Sam twisted his head around and licked Tark's hand, stepped back and considered Tark's eyes. It was as if he knew Tark was not well. Sam turned, gratefully choosing to ignore me, and bolted out of the house. Tark turned to me. In your time or dimension, are you still alive this very moment in which we speak? Do you know if your loved ones think about you? I cannot be in two places at the same time, so my world stops when I am not there and starts again when I return. I thought as much. So, when I die, it will be from here only. Please, don't stay here with me. I promise the wave vibrations of my existence will alter as death approaches. Visit me then. Please, for my mother's sake, to watch over the passing of L'Oreal's son, soul son, and last of the human side of my family. Overcome with emotion, tears began to form in my eyes. Don't cry, time traveler. Don't, because I will not cry when I leave here, although my heart is very heavy, scorning this emotion yet not fearing the unknown. I will die accomplished, productive, fulfilled and in absolute love because it is love that causes my death. And it does so completely and utterly because I have willed it to. I opened my heart, offered my soul, and sent it out to greet my love, the very same love that will now kill me. Look at my skin. When I met my wife, my skin was brown, a rich chocolate brown. Look at it now. My skin fades before my eyes. Although frail, he thrust his forearm toward me. Look, each quantum of my flesh's color has gone into the service of feeding the appetite of love that my wife, Sylph, and I share. As our love grows, my soul diminishes. Must it be so, Tark? It is a choice, time traveler, true choice because we both could have stepped away and decided against permitting ourselves to be in love. A pause, then the silence was broken. You look skeptical. Oh, you don't believe me? Now I feel the trickling tears. The footsteps of fate or that malign partner of fate, destiny hastening to this moment, readily accepting the invitation to be my sole consolation. I don't agree Tark, you are not to blame. You say I had no choice in the matter. Granted, there was a choice at the point before I, or rather we, made our decision to love. But are you saying I had no choice before that, even that tenderness in the moment we decided to be in love? I don't agree Tark, you are not to blame. You say I had no choice in the matter. Granted, there was a choice at the point before I, or rather we, made our decision to love. But are you saying I had no choice before that, even that tenderness in the moment we decided to be in love? I nodded in agreement. What has love done to me, to us, with its criminality, its riot in the soul and looting of spousal affections that I kept stored so darn deep in my heart? No talk. Are you saying that my destiny was established before my birth? He seemed amazed this explanation had not crossed his mind before. Again, all I could do was nod my agreement. This is absurd. 
because although my love lived long before my conception, how could my love's destiny place itself in an entangled moment with one who did not yet exist? A web of waves was woven before you were born. Your motion created the place you now find yourself in. You say that my conception affected the wave vibrations of existence. He stopped to consider this. Given the many births and deaths this would be impossible. Think Tark. I said. A moment elapsed while Tark thought back on the events that led to the exact place in which he now found himself. A delicately cynical smile emerged at the corner of his jaw. Or was it a mere game of chance and my love's love to love me, now reduced purely to an act of randomness? Who knew the heart's desire of my mother before my conception or even after my conception during my birth? Your music, are you aware? Yes, yes, I am aware of the new language of sound. I am it. Still, the destiny of my love was set. But you are saying that my love's agenda was independent from my agenda, even our hopes, dreams and wishes. Tark stopped, then leant forward toward me. Time traveler, I did not desire death over life. Why would I? My music makes many happy. I know this. I know its memory will live on. Still, if you know, tell me why my love undertakes a conspiracy to take me through death, away from the love of those whose love feeds my present moment, the purest right now in my heart. I answered because I also loved L'Oreal's son. Tark, why do you need to know? Because I am in infinite confusion. I do not understand your words. I cannot read your emotions. I am not my mother. I have a profound amygdala and I, well nothing, nothing, time traveler, because I now know that love is bittersweet. Still, I cannot accept that this life will be taken by death's choice to be in love with my love's love outside of this life. Love. Is it possible that the fountain pen, made of gold with finely shaped leaf impressions carved along its shaft, and lightly impressed with garden green as it graced Tark's fingers, gliding effortlessly across the pressed papyrus paper pad, felt sad? My name is Tark, Tark Snowdell. If you are reading this, then I am already dead. At this exact time that I write this, I look forward to the moment of my death. I can see death, my death, clearly, soon not too distant in the future. I am resolute, not seeking help to avert my future death. What cue could a doctor prescribe me? My prolonged existence would just be hollow because I know I will die and understand that there is nothing that can be done about preventing my death. All my paths lead to death and this is the second of only two things of which I am certain. The first has caused the effect of the second upon me. I have exercised my will in this matter, this struggle against the dual consequences of action or inaction. Would you accept death? Would you know you are about to die and do nothing about it? Would you watch your children's sober eyes recording time like liquid crystals flowing in a digital display, no observable change in the body just its shape, its death reproaching shapelessness? Tark, why do you look so pale in both body and soul? Tark recognizes Self's voice, he stands to turn toward her as he replies to her question. Life's lightest touch irks me now that the voices of even our precious twins though sweet, innocent, and a boon, touch me like a mallet does awkwardly aim at a flowering bed of marigolds. He is in pain and visibly flinches as he turns back to the papyrus paper pad resting on his desk. You are feeble my sweet. Yes, dearest Sylph. She walks over to Tark carefully stretching her arms around his waist and left shoulder to gently guide him back down into his desk chair. Sit, sit, and rest your human bones beside me. Maybe my fiery passions will lift those desperate feelings within you to challenge your feeble heart that seeds death far too much ground too easily within your precious body. Death may be too soon, maybe this is not real, but if feeling is a reality of selfish fact, then Sylph, my spirit is almost completely spent of its fill of indulgence. Tark, 
this cannot occur, and me, here, loitering beside you, playing errant nurse when the withering body of my patient crumbles away during my shift. I cannot mount the graveyard hill this day and not fairly fling myself in the same pit prepared for you. Stay with me a little while longer and the news I have for you will rouse your will to life beyond a day or two. Time, time enough for mortal miracles to occur, my only one, sweet, dear, love. Where will my destiny carry me, without you, dear, sweet tar? I live these past years, upon the very essence of your sweet breath, that just the sight of your chest rising, then falling each morning, was to me like the rising and falling of earth's only sun. I have lived beyond what can be counted as a human lifetime and now to see your slow breath is like the ending of a world in which my enhanced heart found a good home. Don't leave me Tark. Don't go into nothing, because if you leave, that is what will become of you. There is no afterlife your race speaks of. All existence that endures from the minuscule to the magnificent feed upon the stuff of life, demanding rejuvenation until form is utterly spent, and then all changes, all mutates into what it was not before. What it was before merges, ceasing to exist here, and is gone. It becomes nothing organic nor ornate that we, here, can know. Toxits, lifts his head, and looks deep into Self's eyes. Sylph, you know this? Yes, 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 with a proud lie in my heart. Yes again. And a thousand more yeses for you, only for you, Tark. Neither of them looks away. Tark's eyes glisten like frost on a windowpane in morning sunlight. I love you, Sylph. You above all, I will miss, as I linger in the great abyss. Self releases her gentle hold on him then swivels his chair around to face her. Her faith crystallizes into transcendent logic that is innate only to members of the Micronet community. Tark, hear me now, there is no abyss. If entropy takes and recreates, how can the essence of the former thing remain? How? Think, my sweet love, of the enhanced. Consider how we shirk our human heritage, which now only remains in the memory of human minds. For a small moment Tuck appears to understand. His face becomes serene but suddenly tenses as a single thought rays from his mind to his mouth now out. Then life's purpose to strive, to achieve is vain if there is nothing outside of our knowing of it, right here and now. The room glows with a final flourish of sunlight leaping off the departing sun now splashed low down upon the horizon in the frail blue west coast sky. Silhouettes emerge. Sylph's darkening form drifts toward the last strong light by the window and they like a herald from the gods she answers talk. In order to be a part of a better existence, we generate energy for our universe by our activity. Our will is the gravity. In a collective together, it gives rise to our consciousness that moves the machinery of our universe. We are merely recycled anew, but quality is the key. She looks through the window. Her words cause Tark to kick off with his left foot pushing the chair away from his desk and closer to her. He stares out of the window up at the receding blue sky. A fresh white breaks up the harmony of the developing sunset. It creates what we often describe as a beautiful evening sky. The music you make colors your soul. It merged with your soul. Your mother wished it so. No tart means no music, no music means no tart. Sylph, I will make music after I die. No tart, there will be only the memory of your music after you die. We will not have any new music composed by you for us to hear. Then what is music if it cannot be heard? It is nonsense, Tark. This cannot be true, Sylph. I exist in flesh and spirit so that the essence of my music must live on. Also, music is a part of me. Music will be made in all the many forms that I will take when I leave this place. 
Despite my cloudy memory I create what I believe will be my own funeral song inside the collapsing walls of my mind. Sylph, we can share moments in dreams together. My spirit will visit you regularly to share memories. No Tark. Those will not be our memories. They will be my memories musing musically upon you, but you will not exist here after you die. It will seem to this world as though you were never born. The enhanced and all creatures with a brain are blessed to be able to keep memories, but memories are a place for things remembered by the living, not a foundation for what we call life to be based upon. The world will remember you through record and memorialization of the signature of your will when you were alive, but beyond that tart, there will not be in this universe or any other place, any record or cosmic memory of you, other than what you left behind at the precise moment of your death. What a cruel heart, Sylph, the enhanced can be cruel when the souls of humankind want sympathy. Aren't we the victims of human hate? If I had time, I would apologize a billion times for your suffering, Sylph, but will 100 apologies satisfy you before I die? Please accept my love and my death as compensation for the guilt of my race. And I would refuse them a billion times if they were offered by you Tark. Your life is more precious than the scars I received. A woman in love cannot let her lover die and not also desire death. My love for you is too real and my heart cries, seeing you like this, so, feeble, and pale. Don't you know I want you to leave? not just for the twin's sake but for us. The blessing that is family gets stronger and stronger when we are together. Tark, don't you care about the love your mother has for you? It is greater than the hidden ancient pirate's Jamaican treasure. Come out of this feeble paleness and let the soul or the spirit that we the enhance call the will, get up and seek life. Seek better than life, seek beyond even death itself. Today I met L'Oreal Snowdell, your mother, Tart, and loyally she cherishes you beyond even her own sweet existence. I called her mother and again confessed my love for her son. She accepted my argument, my anguish and very much wishes to see you alive. My mother? Oh Sylph. I am jealous. Don't be. Silesia and Shra remain with her. My errand was past due and perhaps we have time, but you must listen. For a moment Tark looks lost in childhood memories. Mother. Tark, deliver your own self from this delusion. Come within the reach of my warm arms and sizzling bosom. There you go, take this kiss, and this and this. Hear now the words your mother spoke to me. Darling Sylph. You have to whisper those words softly to me, I am afraid that harsh words might kill me. I understand. I'll whisper warmly in your ear. Don't be scared Tark. Save your own self first and then save us. Make music now, right here once more with me. I'll guide you. Why won't you look at me and make music? I trust you to make the kind of music that will not leave me here alone when you are gone. You remember the type of music that you made to find me? But this time make it better because our love is the signature of our will. Stop it. Reverse it, for the life of our love Tark. We must go beyond death, itself. Beyond. But what kind of love does Sylph de Silva intend to call her own? When to achieve immortality for Tak is a vain, barren, promise to her. Tak himself cannot promise Sylph he will always love her without realizing the pointlessness of his very own words. And Self's quest would be to discover that beyond living, there is more than just nothingness. Self's death, 
although distant and beyond many lives of humankind, is still a passing thought in the mind of an immortal whose existence is the very fundamental principle of the system we call life. It appears as L'Oreal said that self had no choice but to take the enhanced up to the level of immortality or be eclipsed by the very organism that her kind declared, with such certainty to be so inferior. Now, there was a time when people would just die, just roll over and let death have its pitiless way within the world. Humankind created belief in faith as an antidote, a painkiller to anesthetize death's time to kill. Oh damn, but Tark is in love with one of the enhanced, self the silver whose long life carries such proof of our incorrect belief-based faith. How is it that when faced with an apparently impossible dilemma humankind shatters the very cell of impossibility created to imprison itself in whenever there is sufficient will to justify creative genius to overcome an obvious fact? Although he is weak, Tark sits up straight at his desk as self returns. She is seeming even more beautiful and her eyes begin to sparkle like others of her kind as Tark fixes his gaze upon her. He is powerless and is unable to break off the gaze, for in Sylph's eyes he can see into the very mind of a being beyond his understanding of matter. Behind Sylph, Tark senses, then glimpses the gentle flicker of another reality and knows that the wormhole never left Sylph, but always remained, confirming that their life together was based on Sylph's woeful desire from which emerged their authentic love. Is it so that to know love, true love we must seek what is different to us and immerse in it our desire. A rose cannot grow in attendance upon another rose. The earth cannot tend to itself. All must seek difference to evolve, to bloom, to flourish and eventually reach beyond. Is this the secret? Is this the logic the system of our human universe overlooks? But a cat and a dog cannot mate and call such consequent issue evolution. Or can it? Our success, this human world is built upon diversity of matter, and we call this a technological dream. See how much logic has misled the least important of the universe that we are identified as an intelligent life form, but still our lives are relatively short, very brief, when compared to you Sylph, the enhanced who we, in our wisdom merged with computer technology, and are now beyond us. Look at the Cretolian community on Enceladus. Their society is ordered differently because the things of our world are obsolete to them. This is no trifling coincidence. This is a deeper logic that our vanity blinds us to. And yet, even the enhanced must taste the bitter pill of death and exist no more. Even they, the enhanced must create a memory of signatures to mark their existence out in time. But even the memory itself is mortal, because once we are gone, so is the memory. We must thank the cave dwellers for cave walls or how would we truly know ourselves to be? No memory, no record, so memory it seems to me, even memory, evolved through necessity and its place as a fundamental characteristic aspect of humankind, is vainly claimed as we do live, despite its deterioration. My mother carries me as a memory, and it sustains her like the pictures on the walls of a cave sustained the human cave dwellers that they could not forget. Even their children and those they granted favor to, could not forget. So, an incongruent mark against another object is technology, and an aid to memory that even before we started to mark time, was known to be merely a function developed because of the collective conscious to enhance the probability of survival. I understand now Sylph. What do you understand, Tark? All things in our environment must be instantly subject to our will. Yes. My love, we must for the sake of those who love and need us, accept this. Follow me. Tuck stands up and staggers out of the house with self following behind. They arrive at the beach, and he shuffles onto the sand making his way closer to the seafront. The seagulls launch themselves up into the air flying around in crazy circles as Tuck and self disturb their late morning congregate on the white sand. As he gets to the very edge of the beach front Tark clears his lungs with a slow exhale and a sound like multiple various winds of different pitches glide slowly off his resonant voice. The sounds quiver momentarily then plunge into one another creating another fluctuating vibration alongside it, 
like a crescendo's echo of a thousand soft bells, so soft, that they cannot wake even the lightest sleeper. Again, the wave motion of the sounds collapses in upon the fractal form unable to escape each oscillating orbit, yet is forced to cross paths repeatedly, each time creating a sweeter timorous sound that makes the outer edges of each sound wave's orbit sparkle increasingly, while Tuck gently blows the levitating musical symphonic crescendo upward, so that it lingers in front of him and in front of self. It lingers, slightly above both lovers' heads as it glows and glows until it is bigger than both Tuck and self. Left hand raised, Tuck touches the crescendo of living music, and his hand takes on the hue of many oscillating colors as they instantly begin to develop into thousands of glowing patterns that reflect both of their essence. Still, they stand riveted to the spot without neither one speaking. Tark gently clasps, then lifts Self's fiery right hand and with his right hand, reaches for her left. They embrace, I still locked upon one another as the crescendo begins to resonate with a sound that climbs higher becoming less and less audible although the vivacity of activity increases and increases until it can no longer either be heard nor seen. Finally, it pierces the very fabric of the system of life rapidly exiting without the friction of time to slow it down. Fortunately, the signature of its will remains, Tark Snow Dell and Self the Silver. Sylph, I am weak. A little longer, love, just a little longer. I'm trying, Sylph. I don't want to leave you. They say. I, I love, love you. you. In unison as the crescendo of music in the eyes of Sylph the enhanced and tuck the human ceases. Upon its exit it leaves two bodies upon the sand as the waves rise to meet the languid flesh strewn into the shape of love upon the fresh late morning Santa Monica beach shore. All who see us will think us dead. I know Sylph, but we are immortal now. What need do we have of flesh? The End The Music of Tark Snowdle Based on the novel Tark By Mark Miller Copyright 2023 Author Name All Rights Reserved Thank you.